the uh, the electrical stations. We lost power. <laughs> we lost power for about eight hours. I can't even tell you what it's like to have no air conditioning in Vegas in July. It reminds me of that game in Vegas where like there was some cause game going on. I can't remember. I even had a little bit of money on it. And then like within five minutes to play, the power went out. And like the underdog, like the, the bookies were on the other side and the power went out and then they called the game. And so it was a no bet because it, the rules in Vegas is basically after it has to play a certain amount of minutes. It was, it was crazy. Setting fires to electrical stations. All right. All right. We're live. All right. How you doing? I'm doing well. I see, you doing? Getting, I see you're getting photobombed in the background. Yeah, I'm getting photobombed all the time. I'm going to have a lot of people crisscross and damn, might come over here and photobomb me. I'll be uh -oh. changing. Where are you guys at? Changing my hues just in case my mood. Do you want to see? There we go. I was going to say you, you, you got the, the strobe light going. Yeah, strobe blue. <laughs> so where are you at now? Right now I'm in Capri, Italy. Uh, <laughs> just came from Greece over here. Just kind of enjoying life. You're dying with zero. You're doing exactly what the, what the book's all about. Yeah, yeah. The book is about, you know, pursuing your path, making sure you have the experiences you want to have at the right time. And given I'm 51, it's definitely the right time. I'm not, I'm not in the age bucket where it's wise for me to be delaying certain experiences way into the future. Dude, I, I got to tell you, so I'm 54 and your book and your message resonates so well with me, but it, it actually is a book that is so due for a lot of people that are in their 20s, 30s, 40s. If they don't hear this message now, their life will pass them by. Correct. Correct. And it's, it's about like getting off autopilot and being deliberate and purpose, purposeful with what you want out of life, you know, kind of mapping it out. You don't have to have all the answers, right? But you kind of have this kind of general framework of what you want to be doing and when, and you don't want to be just so driven along one train on the earn, 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 because the earn is for experiences, right? The first experience, survival. You want to survive. The next is thriving or whatever other experience you want to have. And, and I'm using that super broadly, like anything, right? From going to the club to charitable giving, to putting your kids in school, to whatever it is, trips to Italy, right? And so you don't want, you don't want to miss out on those periods of your life. So you got two daughters, right? Correct. They're in like that, that teens range, right? Yeah. They're in the age range where they don't want to talk to me. What was, <laughs> or they just want to, they just want to text, just text me dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what, like what was their reaction to the book? Cause I'm actually curious. You're, you 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 do a lot to be a great father. I'm actually curious to how they received the book. Well, for them, it, you know, there was a lot of work. So they, uh, put, putting in the book. So like for them, it was like, whoa, you're taking time away or you're busy or you're on these calls or whatever it is. Um, they kind of get the concepts, but they, they're very shy. Like they don't like the, they like them being on social media. They don't like me on social media, if you get that. And so they get it, they get the ideas, but they haven't, haven't really like, they're, they're, in, they're in revolt mode right now. They don't want to talk about it. They're like, it's taking too much time, dad, yada, yada, yada. So what are some of the people that you've influenced uh, in your life? What are their reactions to the book? Oh, they, they love it. I mean, people have been, I've been talking, I've been blathering about this for like five to 10 years, right? Um, to friends, family, and, and, and snippets of it um, for 20 years, right? And so they've been, they, their feedback, I mean, is like, you've changed my thinking about this. I would have never done this had I not gotten this message thank you. I've had a priceless experience that I'm going to cherish forever. You know, that that's generally the feedback or something to the effect of, wow, I didn't really think about that in terms of inheritance on the timing of when you should give money to your kids. You know what I mean? You know, I, I've just been kind of in this autopilot. I live my life. I die. What's left over, it goes to the kids or, you know, my heirs and, and, and that's that. And, you know, I have a much more deliberate way of thinking about that in the book. And people have given positive feedback about that. I've also gotten feedback like um, some people still resistant. Um, uh, I saw some of that. Yeah, it's still resistant of fears or it's about, you know, you got to have money. It's easy for you to save when you have money, et cetera. And I, I, I wonder if that's coming from um, people who've actually 
finish the book because it's not about lighting money on fire. It's about purposeful living, you know, and optimizing your life. And so I, I, I really want to hear that from someone that I know has read the book or at least listened to the book, you know. Uh, Do you have it on uh, audio? Yes, there's audio book. I get that question a lot. Is out there on audio book. You go to Amazon, drop down audio book, boom. And if you got Prime, you get it for free. What? Yeah, like Prime, like Prime trials. Like if you just signed up for Prime, you you can get the audio book for free. That's awesome. Well, is, is it on uh, Audible? Is it on Audible? I think it's on Audible. I think it's on a bunch of them. That's awesome. Uh, I think it's on a bunch of them. Like it's definitely on the drop down menu. Kindle, Audible, all these other things. Did you uh, did you do the audio or did somebody else do it? I did it. I did it. I did a survey on Twitter and, and, and most people said, it, which made sense, is that there was a slight preference for the author. And then there was in the comments, it was like, listen, if it's your life and your stories, it's got to be you. Got to you know? And I didn't want to do that. I don't like my voice. You know, I hate hearing my own voice. And the so, voice uh, and so uh, I was like, oh, man, I don't want to do it. But once I got that feedback, I was like, no, I have to do it. It's correct. It is. It is my story. There are my stories. There are how I came to this um, met method of thinking, you know, and so I needed to, I needed to be the one to tell that story. We can't, can't, can't outsource that one. Have you had a chance to cross paths with Tony Robbins? No, I have not. But I used to work with him long, long time ago. And, you know, obviously he does all of his stuff himself, all of his books, all of his audio training, the whole nine yards. And that is an authentic way to connect with the actual author. And that, that's one of the things that we found out early on is it was an authentic connection with the message from the author. Yeah, it's definitely, these are, these are real stories that happened to me, real, real processes, like real, you know, something happens to you in life and like you may know it or whatever, but until you like feel it and it's happened to you or something is experienced, then it like sinks in. It's like, oh, wow, this is part of my programming now. I have accepted this message. And I am now going to alter my behavior going forward, right? And, and you know, you, you get those moments in the book. You know, it's not about me. The book is really about you optimizing your life. But I'm giving you how I, I came across it. Otherwise, it'd be boring, right? It'd be this big economist book with all these charts and graphs and baloney. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So did you ever see the movie The Bucket List with... Uh... God, what was that actor? You, uh, I think it was Morgan Freeman and uh, Jack Nicholson, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did, did see that, that movie. Did that have any effect on you? Because I think that, that movie came out, what, like eight, nine years ago? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't like the movie. I mean, I liked the movie, but I didn't like the movie because it did have an effect. It was like, these motherfuckers waited too long. You That's know? what like, I thought. <laughs> you know, excuse my French, but I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Like, Oh, this is, by the way, this is uncensored. We could do all that and then some. We can do whatever we want. Um, so like, you know, and, and, it, and, it, and it bothered me because it reinforces this idea uh, that you could just wait. Somehow you're going to be kind of knowing you're going to die within two months or three months. And then you can just have this big long list and fly around the world and tick them off. And it's like, it doesn't go that way, people. It does not go that way. I, I travel around the world. I see the senior tour buses. I see the retirees coming in. You know, I tell a story about when I was in St. Petersburg and it's great because you can like climb the steps of the churches and go on the balconies and walk around like you do stuff that you normally like in America. They'd be like, no way. The guy might fall off and die or all this other stuff because the railing's low. Not a single person off of those buses, 65, climbed those 211 steps. Not a single person. Now, I'm not saying they're not enjoying St. Petersburg, but it's not the same St. Petersburg that I got to enjoy, which means they had a less of an experience, right? They didn't get as much bang for their buck uh, going to St. Petersburg by delaying it. And so depending on what you like and what you do and, and what experiences you want to have, you got to get that ordering right. You know, I, I've been using the, uh, what well, we just lost light, but the club, <laughs> the club, the club went dark. Now yeah, is exactly. the after party. Get the glow sticks <laughs> out. No. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that old game Tetris, you know, Tetris. Oh my yeah. God. Who doesn't? Okay, so, so it's like you're in heaven and God goes, okay, you can have all these activities. It's in a big bucket, right? But you got to get the order right. If you don't get the order right, you don't get to unpack and pack all these experiences in. So like if you start delaying, you know, heli skiing to 86 or, or wave running, you know, for me at 75, 
You just don't get it. Sorry, we gave you your shot on earth. You just, you just kind of blew it. You don't get the high score. You know what I mean? And I don't mean high score like life is a, a race to, to get do all these things, but it is your chance to have the experiences you want in your one ride. And you have to consider, you know, each season of your life, you know, seasons pass, you know, kids get older, you know, I, I want to hang out with my kids. I hang out. They're like, peace out, dad. I want to hang out with my friends, whatever. This is weird. You know, when they were younger, they want to be around me all the time. Right. And so, you know, there was a time for me to spend X amount of time with them. And there's a time where they're just like, they're on their own. And, and if I didn't, have those experiences when they were younger, they're gone forever. I only get to live off the memories of those experiences, right? And I get a little bit of time now. And that goes with all sorts of activities, every single activity. And so what we do is try and represent that in a mental model and summate, do a summation of all those activities and show like, this is, this is what happens, you know? You have this kind of, let me get the graph going down, right? Of, of what you're able to do. Meanwhile, your money may be doing this, but your ability to convert it into experiences is diminishing. And so that's kind of what the book is about, is about optimizing and maximizing your life, your experiences here on earth. You know, uh, there's a crisis around the world right now. And a lot of people are probably at a point where they're evaluating things, you know, kids that are going to college, they might take a leap year because college might not be for them right now. There's probably no classes, you know, online learning for the money that they're charging isn't probably worth it. So there's a lot of people that are probably saying, hey, you know what, let me take a leap year if I'm in college, let me go take an experience year. And I think yeah. what your book is all about is making an, making your life an experience year. Yeah, it, it definitely is. It's, it's about getting as, as much as you can, given your resources, right? Like every people, people are varying degrees of resources, ingenuity, risk, et cetera. You know, and I, I always say, take, take max risk you can. You're, in Europe, a gap year, like, when you graduate high school and then going backpack around the world, that's a, much more common than in the United States. In the United much States, more common. Go, 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 go. I was in Australia visiting my brother and there was just all these kids coming to Australia because they pay like $25 an hour if you work in like, you know, just a job. Like minimum wage is like 20. You work overtime, it's 25 or whatever it is. If you work on a Saturday and they save up the money and then they go backpacking through Asia, Asia and go on their adventures across the world. Um, and I, I thought, that's amazing. I wish I did that. Um, and but on the other side of that, there's people at work who are earning, earning, earning and not experiencing. Right. And so to the extent that they delay that past the grave, they never get those experiences. And to the extent that their health declines or their attitude changes or, or, or you know, what I mean, their energy declines, they either get less of an experience or no experience. And so I, I'm like, hey, we got to think about our lives from now, wherever you are, 20, 30, 50, uh, to the grave and start thinking about what do we want out of it? Get off autopilot and like, what do we want out of it? You know, and everybody's different. So like, you know, you, somebody might have a funky curve, like, hey, I don't care what you say. I'm saving all my money up to go on a cruise at 90. You know what I mean? <laughs> if, that, if, if you've thought it through, that's for you. You know what I mean? But what I don't want to have that happen is, is people looking back on their life, the narrative of their life and, and full of what it could have should have. You know? So, you know, Dave Swanson, a friend of uh, yeah. Dan's. So listen, this is the best thing about Dave. I, I'm friends with him and his wife, Amanda. The last couple of years, he's made it his life to go and do something he's super passionate about. And that is go to Fiji and surf and, and he is a great example, living example. Like he's literally one of my favorite uh, people in life because he's, he's shown other people, go pursue your dreams. Your life won't skip a beat. You financially don't have to take a back seat. You can literally squeeze, in his case, surfing and the joy of surfing while you're able to enjoy surfing. Not only that, he's doing charity work while he's out there. All American Dave, as, as, as many people know him in, in, in the poker com community, yeah, he's definitely, definitely extracting out of life what he wants at this moment. He's got his family. He's got his, you know. Uh, Second baby. Two, two babies now, right? Like, and then, and uh, you know, he's surfing. He's, he's doing, he's making a con contribution to the world and the community. He's living by his morals and principles. He's, he's living a pretty adventurous ride. And I don't think he's going to look back on this period going, oh, I wish I would have taken time away from my food truck and, 
you know what I mean, did X, Y, and Z. Like he's consciously and deliberately living. And I think there's a lot of people at um, various resource levels who are, who are optimizing, right? And there's optimizations within those optimizations, right? Like, well, like people might be like, well, how did Dave do it? You know what I mean? Like, and you can go talk to him or, or, or other people who are like, well, this is how you do it. But the, at the top level where I'm optimizing is to get your brain thinking like, hey, you know what I mean? Like, this is how my health is going to climb. This is how my attitude is going to This is how other decisions are going to affect future decisions, right? Like one of them is like getting married. Like that, that changes your whole calculus on a lot of other decisions. When you get married, it switches. Shout out to you while recently getting engaged. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then the, the, the biggest one is having kids, right? Like you, depending on your, you know, how you would raise your kids or what you have an idea, as soon as you make that decision, having kids, you made like 30,000 other decisions. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know it, but at that time, 30,000 switches just went on and you're just waiting to live and to make those things. You know, I had, at one time I was with Dan, he was like, What's the matter with you? Why can't you come here and blah, blah, blah? He's like, why are you flying home to go to a soccer game? I'm like, Dan, I made that decision 13 years ago. I just didn't know it then, but I made that decision 13 years ago that I would not be able to hang out with you on this trip, that I would have to leave early and I would have to go, I would have to go home. All you right, know? here's a hot take. Yeah. Probably nobody will ever say it in their lifetime. Someday, Dan Bilzerian's going to make a great father. Wow, that's a he's got to he's got to get a sperm count up, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, he'll fly to Panama to get that fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll fly wherever he's got to do. He'll take whatever pills he's got to take, whatever. If but he's yeah, if I he's anything he's, like his dad and Adam, he'll be a great father. Yeah, he's uh, you know, the funny thing is, is that um, I, I never, I, I I didn't see it as that something he wanted to do, but there's been some words spoken that that's something I think he wants to experience in life. I think it's in his family genes. He's got a great dad. He's got a brother that's a great dad. It's just genetic. Now, granted, um, he's probably going that, down a different road to get there, but I'm telling you, hot take, Dan Bilzerian will make a great father one day. Well, we'll, we'll we, we, we may get to, we may get to, um, we may get to, uh, sorry, I'm wiggling over here. They're bringing something over. Um, oh, it's okay. My dog's yelling at the Amazon driver. Yeah, we may get to see, we may get to see about that. I think so. I think in my lifetime, at least, <laughs> yeah. probably sooner than we think, too. I would think so, too, because, I mean, you know, Dan, Dan's reflective, you know, and he, if, he, if he gets, he's, I think he's slowly coming to the realization that that's something he wants the joy of fatherhood, you know, and, and, you know, you definitely get joy out of fatherhood. Fun is comes and goes, right? <laughs> joy, joy and fun are two different things, right? Like kids are fun. But a lot of times it's it's work and 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 you know rearing a human being can be be pretty tough and so I would say that um, I would say that you know there's always joy though no matter what even when you're giving hard lessons and you're dealing and they're being a pain in the butt it's just joy you know so you've lived your book for a long time I've seen it from a distance you've lived the actual book for a long time talk about three experiences that you've lived that are an examples of dying with zero excru excruciating or extra extracting life out of life well yeah well so I'll, I'll just go some of the principles and i'll try and match them to a certain experience like one i do right now is like um it wasn't this time but it was on my birthday and, and dan was with me we were hanging out and they were doing this uh they were going wakeboarding and, and i like wakeboarding but i have a and i was like nah you know i don't, I don't want to go wakeboarding like whatever get in water's not warm enough whatever and, I, and then i thought about it i was like you know what i have a degenerative back issue with cartilage from playing football and my wakeboarding days are going to come to an end soon whether i do it or not they're going to come to an end right like not by choice but but like i cannot do this anymore so i got my ass out there and i was like I'm going to wait for it. I'm going to go give it a spin because I do not want to miss out. This may be my last chance in this beautiful setting with friends to enjoy this moment. I want to create this memory. Two is on an annual basis. Um, I check in with my CFO, my, my accountant. I go, well, how much have I spent on travel? How much have I spent on this? What was my, what was my net earnings? How much have I given to charity? And I'll adjust these things. I'll check in quarterly on the travel, right? I'll go, Oh shit, I need to up, you know what I mean? Like, cause I need to convert it into experiences and travel 
leads to all kinds of other different types of experience. So for me, it's a macro optimization. You know what I mean? Force the travel, other, other experiences happen. And so I'm constantly like in a very uh, numerical way um, optimizing, you know, f for that. Because if, if, if I, like my, I'm in the age where it's like pretty soon I should be, and I discuss it in a book where my net worth should peak. It doesn't matter. If I make, ex if I make $10 extra more, I need to spend $10 plus a little, right? Because I'm, I'm going down towards zero. I'm not quite there yet, but. I should not be rocketing up and, and wealth, right? And so like, I'm like, it's gotta get spent. It's gotta get convert. And if I can't, and in my charity budget, and if I'm like, hey, I'm doing all the experiences I wanna do, then my charity budget just goes further up, right? Because the time to, to impact people's lives is now. And so that that's another, and I'm trying to think the, th the third. Um, I guess the third would be, um, you know, I'm very deliberate about like, I'm going back and forth. The number, I don't know. Like, how much did you leave your kids? This, the entire empire. I go back and forth, right, on give them a gazillion or give them nothing, right? And there's people on arguments on both sides. But I, I'm on to give them something. So I'm, um, I'm very deliberate on making sure that I fund those accounts, I keep them separate, and I, I constantly am talking with friends, experts, reading up on what structures and stuff to set aside for them. You know, and if I don't have it in cash right away, I, I, I push it into a side to keep it so it's their money. So that if I go bust, which I can easily go bust because I've been bust twice, you know, twice before, you know, um, that I'm not busting them. So as you look back on all the things that you're doing, have you thought about creating some sort of group where people can share their die with zero experiences? The Because I think the book, you're distributing the book. You just launched it maybe, what, a couple of weeks ago? 28th. I think if you look back a year and a year and a year from now, if you look back year over year over year, that book, maybe not like the Bible, but that book is going to change people's lives. They're going to have an experience because of the book. They're going to change their mindset because of the book. And their lives are going to be significantly impacted because of the book. Have you thought about creating a group or something where people can share those stories? Well, that's the aim of the book is to, to, to significantly impact people's lives who read the book. But not only that, I just wanna give just a little tangent on that. When, when I impact somebody who's like been working like a dog and saving up their money and not spending it, it's under the mattress and they take that money and they're like, no, I'm gonna have a great life. Not only do they have experiences with themselves and stuff like that and change their life, with their loved ones and do charitable giving, but that money does not go into outer space. It goes into the service providers, the guides, the people that help them live those experiences. The velocity of money goes up just a little bit. So the more people we have doing this, living their lives, the higher the velocity of money. So it's not just you, you help, you help other people just by commerce and what's going on, right? The way our society works. And so, that's a big impact. So going back to the, this book and, and people like congregate. So I have a good friend, Scott Shepherd, who's, who's like built, this is a movement, you know, we're going to, he's revamped the website. He's giving the mental models out. He's like, look, we're going to have it so that people can spread the word. Right. And I, I have a saying, like, nobody does anything great alone. Me publishing this book, that's great. Other people read it. But if it's going to be a movement and it's really going to make a big change in, in many, many people's lives, it's going to take people who've read the book, who've lived it, who's gotten value out of it, sharing their stories, creating a community and spreading the word, right? Spreading the gospel, right? And so we're kind of working on that. You know, think, that's not my area of expertise. I'm bringing, I'm bringing in people in there. But I think it's the way, you know, the FIRE movement, which is the financial, ind financial independence retire early, right, was launched by a book basically Vicky Robin and, and Dominguez and Vicky Robin is like the grandmother of the fire, fire movement. That book launched the fire movement, which I talk about in my book, you know, I, I, fire and my book, they, ha they have some overlap. There's significant differences. There's, there's one major significant difference between uh, fire and, and, and my, my book. And in fire, it's basically like, Hey, get off autopilot. You're, you're wasting your money on all these ego things really get in touch with yourself, really become aware. My book is really about being aware as well. The fire guys say, hey, you can live super frugal 
then retire early, call it 40, 45 or whatever, and then live your life off the interest in your money and your investment earnings and not have to work and pursue where all your dreams were to do. I'm like, that's a great, but there's a big problem with that. What happens between 20 and 45? Do you just go into jail for, for 25, you know what I mean, 25 years? I don't advise that, right? There's, there's many reasons why I don't advise that. Like specifically, we talked about ex certain experiences meant for certain periods. You know what I mean? You can't get your 20s back. You can't even get your early 30s back. And so if you're, you're, you're sacrificing that, you know, I, you gotta be aware of that. Now, if you're aware of that and you're like, hey, I'm the type of guy that will go to, into jail for 25 years <laughs> in exchange for never having to work again. Okay, I, I don't recommend that. Here's the reasons why. But if you thought it through, okay. You know, it's funny, five years ago, um, I woke up and I was blind in the side because I had a stroke in the middle of the night. And the vein in here stopped pumping blood uh, and oxygen into the eye. So for about a year, I got used to only having one eye, which it, it gets depressing because you're like, wait a second, you know, I don't have two eyes. There's things I can't do. But like after about a year of feeling sorry for myself, which I would never recommend to anybody, I kind of adopted a lot of the things you talk about in the book. I started realizing, wait a second, I'm going to start enjoying and doing things in my life. Now, I am never putting anything off again because there is, there, there's going to be things that change in my life physically or just come to abrupt halts. And I don't want to miss out on those experiences and having a full experience. So Thank it's you. amazing, you know, you wrote this book now and I think over the last four years, I've had the mindset of living my life by the terms of that book um, only because I had a life experience. But if I didn't have that life experience, I probably over the last four years would have not done a lot of the things that I've done and, and it would have been less of a life. Yeah. You, you, you had a, an event happen to you that, that brought you in touch with those principles, right? Like you, you discovered it this way, right? I, I and in my book, I did, I talk about how I discovered it over, uh, over, the, <coughs> over the years. And, and sometimes, you know, Life cycle hypothesis, which a, a lot of this 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 philosophy is, is 1957 uh, Italian economist, um, you know, came up with this uh, theory, and they later won a Nobel Prize on, on life cycle hypothesis, which is basically a spending and ending ending your life with zero, and in order to maximize what you get out of it, you know, people can go look that up and do the math themselves. But a lot of times, you come to the rational cold hard truth or certain facts through emotional processes or, or, or events, epiphanies, you know? And so, that, and, and that's how we overcome our resistance to certain things. Like maybe, maybe had you not had that stroke, your other excuses or your what abouts, right? What about this? What about that? What have held you back from having those experiences? And then you have this event and you're like, fuck that shit. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fucking wasting my life. Like, what am I, what am I thinking? You know, other shit can go wrong. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, my my exact attitude was fuck that shit. I got one good eye. If that fucker goes out, I'm never going to experience these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get down to one eye, you start realizing, holy fuck, I'm one bad accent away from not seeing the things that I want to see, not experiencing yeah. the things I want. Because without vision, life experiences go down dramatically. Right. And, and it, yeah. So, I, I, so I actually started realizing, wait a second. I'm probably going to die and I'm probably, well, I'm definitely going to die, but I'm probably at risk of losing my other eye. So I have to say to myself, what can I do to squeeze everything out of life while I've got one good eye? So that was my attitude is I just said to myself, the visuals of experiencing life, take those away and everything goes dramatically down. Yeah. You, 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 you came, you came in contact like in a visceral way with the scarcity of life and, and experiences and how it goes by fast like yeah it, that experience you got it to you I, I i i you know obviously you don't want that to happen to anybody else and 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 and, I, and we don't want to have that i'd rather you just you know learn the easy way read the book get in touch with it apply it to your life so you get the most out of life as well right but sometimes it, it takes it takes events you know all right so 
you've had an amazing life so far. You've done some amazingly good things. What are some of the business things that you could share with people that have gotten you to the point where I think you've really gotten your mind right? You've put your mind in a good place where you're in control of your mind and therefore in control of your future. Wow, business things in terms of just, earn, I, I think, you know, I've been in a leverage field and right in trading, right? So I've been, I've been a trader and, that, and that's got me uh, economically to a certain point. Then I opened my own fund. Right. And I have all these other businesses. But one of, one of the things that kind of got my mind right about like, yeah, I'm living life and I'm having these good things is that the odd concept of working on your business, not in your business. Right. This I'm a master delegator. A lot of times people ask me, like, how much does that cost or what does this do? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I hire that guy. <laughs> this is the computer guy. This is my AI guy. This is whatever. If I am not the guy for that thing, I fire myself. I'm fired. The bookkeeping, I'm fired. Budgeting, I'm fired. You know, I am like strategic guy, you know, working on where the ship is going and everybody else is batting down the hatches, cooking the food, doing the fuel, optimizing, doing the targeting, checking the waves, you know, that that's how it goes. And so I, I run my life that way. And what that allows me to do is freedom. I can think strategically. Yeah, I had to give up all these salaries and take on this risk associated with bringing these people on. But once that ship is right, sales itself, you know, I'm in, I'm in Capri and I'm, I'm going to have a slice of pizza. You know what I'm saying here? You know, that's how, that's how I, I think that's about as good as it gets. Like if you're going to go get pizza, oh. it's got to come from Italy. Like the best pizza has yeah. got to be in Italy. Yes. It it's pretty damn good. All right. So here's, here's the question. This is a bar stool moment. There's a Dave Portnoy moment. Rate that slice of pizza from Capri. Want to help me out here on this one? What would you, I'm going to go. Hi. Now, I think the pizza in Positano, this is Lara, my fiance now, but. uh um, Stop, Lara. I, I'm going to say Positano has better pizza than Capri, but don't tell anybody I said that here. But I'm going to give this an eight. You're going to give it an eight. Yeah. What do you think, Laura? You're gonna you're gonna rate the pizza? It's pretty damn good. I would give it like an oh, like an eight and a half. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So, Laura, what has the Die With Zero book done for your mindset and perspective? Wow. Um. Wow. Very deep question for my mindset and perspective. I think honestly, the biggest impact it's had on me is actually on my family. You know, I, I think and my, my family and my friends who I just think that they're kind of striving and they're they're all about working and working to get to the next level. Um, they don't necessarily take those breaks and I say, hey, I'm doing this. Come, you know, I invite them here or there and they say, I'm sorry, like I can't go because free too. I'm paying. Yeah. And they say, you know, I can't go because of my boss. And no, I can't go because if I miss this, then I don't get this promotion X, Y, Z. And I'm like, okay, you're missing out on these amazing life experiences and they're one of a kind experiences. And then they get this FOMO from, you know, obviously we're posting stuff on social media and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't go. Like, what was I thinking? I'm like, dude, like live your life, you know? Like we don't know this pandemic happened. We don't know how much time we have. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. We didn't know that Italy was going to last. But I also want to interject like from like, I'm more quantitative, right? About it. Like she's talking about like from an emotional standpoint, which is very important and the FOMO, but here's the deal, right? You're going to work in order to have these experiences, right? To buy them later, right? Like to, to go vacation. I'm like, wait, you don't we're even have to. <laughs> we're offering you like a free vacation. So that's <laughs> irony. It, it's crazy. It's, it's kind of crazy, it's right? The, the yeah. irony of it all is hysterical. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, I think the, you know, me putting into like a laid out, book, you know, and people, you know, hearing the principles out there, I think it's sinking in, you know, sometimes, listen, I'm a hard way learner myself, like, I don't necessarily learn from other people's mistakes, I got to make the mistake, or I got to experience it first, right. So I think, you know, it takes a, a couple times for some, some of it to sink in, right, to, to get to people, because to be fair, we've been habituated into this, like, kind of rat race, climb to the next level, get to the next level, get to the next level, get to the next level. And it's like, 
you realized you were getting to the level to do this other stuff. That's why you were climbing in the first place. You weren't climbing just to be climbing. This ain't a game of Donkey Kong where you just get up to the top and it's high score. This All right, we just we just struck gold. We have a Donkey Kong reference. No. <laughs> if we get a Galaga reference next, this this is it. Defender Stargate. <laughs> okay, wait a second. I'm going to drop a term on, based on your reaction. You've either played it or not. NBA Jam. Yeah, of course. Oh my God! Great, greatest <laughs> arcade game ever. Yeah. <laughs> If you hit like three jump shots in a row, the basketball would turn into a flaming ball. Yeah, it's like a flaming ball and you're on fire. Yeah. <laughs> How about when Patrick Ewing would block the shot? Get that shit out of here! <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are great games. Wow, the flaming. You, I forgot about the flaming ball. As soon as you said, I'm like, oh yeah, the flame. Three weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine that just moved out here to Vegas and we brought it up. And just for shits and giggles, I went online to see if you could buy that game, the arcade game. It was yeah. 4 99 at Best Buy. I've got yeah. it here in a couple of days. Literally, I couldn't believe I could buy that game for $4.99. It's know, literally, it's, and it's a four-person game. Laura, have you ever played it? No, I've never played it. Yeah, she's no, not. No. It's, <laughs> even, even if you're not into basketball, it's a sick game because it just has some funny shit in there. Like, it, it just would and then here's the other thing too. It allows for aggressive defense. Like they push guys out of the lane. Get out yeah. of here! <laughs> like, what the hell was that? You know, like elbowing I, guys. On the side. I used to when I was like in my twenties, going buy a roll of quarters from the bank, go to the arcade, and I would lock. Me and my friend would lock that game down for hours. That was that was your game, huh? I was oh my a defender God. for a while. I'll be honest with you. Until you play that game now. You don't realize how how a de-stressing event that is. I got you. You inspired me. Get some arcade games. You, you inspired me. I gotta get it. I'll I be honest. If you get it and you let your daughters play, they will be ruthless. <laughs> they will be ruthless. Yeah, they're pretty ruthless. They they're into these they're like high tech. Ruthless, trust me. Yeah, so I'm playing. <laughs> they look so sweet though. Yeah, yeah until <laughs> until you see them play G Grand Theft Auto and you're like. Ooh, these psychopaths. <laughs> I'm like, that might be. That was quarantine. What was that? Yeah, I was like, lock the door, babe. Wear the knives. You know what I mean? Like, hey, tell tell Lara my hot take from earlier about Bill Zarian. Oh, he thinks Dan will be a great dad one day. Oh yeah, he absolutely will. We have like great conversations, parenting. Like, he, it's it's so weird to get parenting advice from Dan Bilzerian. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the weirdest thing, but he just makes really great points and. <laughs> Well, he's a phenomenal uncle to Adam's kids. Totally. No, I, I mean, I would trust Adam. I, I mean, I would trust him. Wait, hold on. Wait a second. What? <laughs> would I trust him with my life? And then I'm thinking, oh, like when we go off roading, like he's crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you trust him, I would trust him with my kids' lives. Let's say that. 100%. Yeah, he's like, over the, but yeah, yeah he'll definitely put our list of life. He'll definitely have us like base jumping. Do you try to convince me to go base jumping? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's base jumping again? Is that off the bridge? Yeah, like off a bridge with the parachute, and it only has a certain amount of time. More you than jumped you, out of a they, helicopter with him in Bali. Yeah, but that was kind of low into the water, into the low. ocean. No, that actually was super dangerous. Because oh, yeah, because shallow I, water. Yeah, we didn't even know we hit the bottom. <laughs> we, yeah, we could have died there. So, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, you know, I'm not, <laughs> but with kids, I don't think he would, he would do that. <laughs> Did you guys ever see the Dan Bilzerian, Joe Rogan uh, interview? No, I was there actually. I, I came there, hung out for a bit, left, but I never saw the full interview. Got to watch it. It's probably one of the best interviews Joe's ever done. Just, uh, just peeling away the layers of Dan's life. Yeah. This well, piece, this get piece, ready for the book then. <laughs> yeah, get ready for the book. He's writing a book right now as we speak. Didn't he finish it? It's finished, but he's got a, I mean, he wrote like a, I don't know, a 900 page book. That thing's got to be cut in half, <laughs> you what know, did, so. Did he write, uh, what's the girl, JK Rowling, what did what'd she write? Harry Potter. Harry, yeah, it's the it's the Harry Potter of Dan Bilzerian. Yeah, oops. Gotta cut that down. Yeah, it's, what, it's what's the title? Dan Bilzerian, I think. It's gotta be Blitz. Literally, big letters, Blitz. I don't know. It might be. Night? No, 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 no. So it is this be. the place where the grotto is? Yes. Oh, this killer fucking grotto. The guy, the guy who's uh, who, who, whatever he put up here, it's really nice. He did a really good job. Well, the grotto looks amazing. Like just yeah, yeah, it's like you go in, you go down, you got a house, you take a little elevator down there, you got a little grotto and spa room, and it's pretty nice. I mean, I'm happy. I'm very fortunate to be able to rent this thing. 
I think I think you're doing what life, you're squeezing the experiences from life. There's there's literally never going to be another chance to do what you can do today. And then that's gone. And then tomorrow you've got a chance to do things that you can never do again then. And that's yeah. the way I that's the way I've looked at life for a long time. Well, probably re- more so recently. You know, I'm just adapting, bobbing and weaving. You know, I had all these grand plans for the summer and then COVID hit and they all got, you know. Hey, by the way, how did you guys get to go to Italy anyhow? I thought Americans weren't allowed to Italy. Yeah, everybody wants to know this story. I've been telling everybody. So, so Croatia is in the EU and it's open. You can go to Croatia and, it, it, and actually the EU is on discount. And, you, and if you've had a negative COVID test within 48 hours when you land, and you stay in Croatia for two weeks. Other EU countries will go. If you've been in an EU country in the eurozone for two weeks, COVID free, then they are open to accepting you. Got so it. Now the, the focus is not necessarily whether you're an American or not. It would be really unfair to expats living abroad, right? It's where have you been, you know, in in the past. Right now, I guess the the time frame is two weeks. They can change it, but you just got to follow. Like I have a very good. Um, my ex assistant runs a, uh, she went into the travel business. She runs a boutique travel service called Brio Travel. She's on top of it. So I just, like I said, I outsource. She outsources it. She tracks all the, the consulates and all the rules and regulations and figures out how to do it. I got to say, um, the pictures on the night that you asked Lara to marry you, fucking GQ. I mean, <laughs> Laura, you were crushing it in that dress, but I'm telling you, have you ever seen uh, Miami Vice? Uh, actually, I don't think it, I no, it might be, it might be, you know, no. she's younger. So no. Okay, he he was crushing it Miami Vice style that night. Miami Vice, like, yeah. You. Thanks. So that was that was a well planned wardrobe night. Yeah, it was definitely everything was romance is planning. So I planned a lot out on that night and it, it went well. I would say it went well, right? I would say so. Yeah, as long as you say yes, it's good. Here we are. It's good by me. <laughs> How long have you guys been together now? What's that? How long have you guys been together now? Four and a half years. Oh. I mean, well, we've known each other. We've been- no. we, Yeah, four, yeah. Well, yeah, 4.5 years. And we known each other five years or we know four and a half years and whatever. So we've been, uh, June 4th, it was four years that we've been together. We knew each other for about six months. Damn, you got some guns, girl. Look at what the... Damn. Bang, bang. Yeah, look at that, babe. You got the underboob going. I know. Look at that. <laughs> I'm telling you, the fans love it. Oh, this is appropriate for You're you. The fans. This is... This, this, this it's is Europe. Nothing. We can curse. We can do all kinds of things here. It's it's Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Under, this, this, under boob's not a big deal in Europe. Under the regulations are a lot different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They've been running around naked around this place. like this place. So... When's the wedding? A year out? A week out? Um, we don't really know. Honestly, we just wanted to get to the next stage of our relationship and just take it day by day. And it's it's not really. Um, she won't let people know, like, bam, you know, stay away, stay away, <laughs> bitches. No, I'm just kidding. Kind of, kind of. <laughs> she just went. <laughs> let's see. Let's see the. Let's see the. I don't know if you can see it. Whoa! I got to tell you, Bill, that's a good ring. That is a very good ring. I, I, I don't. I, I. Thought, no, he doesn't even let me walk alone at, at night. I thought. It was, I thought it was like a little. I thought it was a little big, but I don't know. The jeweler was just like, a diamond's only too big if it's on another woman's hand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's. So Laura, did you like the ring? Oh my god! Yeah. I, did, did you have any input, or were you surprised? No, I was no. completely surprised. Actually, um, she was paralyzed. I was dead. I was like, I blacked out. I think for a couple minutes. She didn't hear a word I was saying. <laughs> I'm dead serious. She didn't hear a word I was saying. Just tears were coming out. I, I was on my knee. I was talking. You did she it right. Didn't, it pretty, she didn't, she didn't hear a accurate. thing. It's pretty accurate. Um, I just never really, you know, my parents were divorced and my mom got remarried and then divorced again. So for me, marriage wasn't always like, oh, you just, you know, you just dream about getting married. And I, yeah, I saw fairy tales and I've, I've seen my friends, parents together, but then divorce after they got, you know, they went to college. So marriage to me wasn't always like something that I just dreamed about the, the day that I was going to get married. So the ring, you know, oh, it needs to be this cut and this is how it's going to be. And my dress is going to be this way. And I mean, I think that wasn't anything that was really important to me, you know? 
You know, it's funny because I think uh, yeah. 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 I think you guys are really good for each other because your perspective is on what matters, not what clothing or what look or what material things. And that's important because marriage is a journey. And most people, like you said, most people never finish that journey. So unless if you have your if you have the right mindset, you can you can go really far and really it's really about the having the right mindset together. Yeah. So I mean, he could have put a little. T- I mean, it could have been a fraction of a what cheerio. it was. Yeah. Could have been a cheerio. And I would have been just as ecstatic, honestly. So. But you know me. I'm. I'm but, yeah. I'll be. I was just thinking. I'm thinking to myself. Zero chance he was getting a cherry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> zero chance. Zero chance of that going like, I'm like, you're going to remember this. <laughs> you're going to remember this day. So. You guys look super happy, by the way. And not just now, but like, I think like 97% of the time I've ever seen pictures, you guys look super happy. In general, like it, we are. I mean, like, it's weird because I, we just spend so much time together. Like we spend... Like most people, like they'll go to work, they got to go to an office, a nine to five. It's like, no, me, I have my phone and I'm on my boat or whatever. So we don't like have this routine where we leave each other for eight hours during the day. You guys stay mostly in the island, right? Yeah, islands and, and, and Houston. Houston. In Houston, because the, gr- the girls LA. are in school, at Houston and LA travel a lot. But um, we're, just, we're just together a lot. And we, it's just unnatural we just to be apart. We really, really well together. We just like, we kind of, I, I, I don't know, we just have a thing. All right, Laura, one good question. Okay. So you can't say anything. Can't influence this answer. I can't influence. All right. Tell us three know. funny things about Bill in the four and a half year, years you guys have been together. Oh, man. Oh, oh. You can say whatever. And by the way, the toilet seat does not count. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of three, three funny things. You can say oh, anything you want. Yeah, this is so hard. Yeah, it's on the spot. You're crushing her. She's not like. So. Obviously, you guys know he wears the same hat every day. Like the same, he wears the same freaking hat every day. And I try to change the hat, I change it out, I hide it from him. He still, he still manages to find a way to find his hat. Where is this hat? I've, I've literally, I, I can't I even think of the hat. I think of it. Oh, it's the life is a good hat. I actually have a bunch of them. So what do you mean? oh, I've seen that hat. Yeah, I, I've seen that hat. You wore it at a, a bunch of the poker games you play. Yeah, yeah. You literally wear that same hat. All right, so what's the deal with that hat? We're gonna lose. Like, if this was a dating game, we'd get like I know, zero I know, points. I know, I know, I know. It's okay. I'll buy. I'll buy you some time, Laura. What's the I'm deal with the hat? Ask me some questions, but let me think about it. What's the deal with the hat? Is um, it superstition? No, it's kind of like I, I heard about the founders who who made this guy Jake, who's the happy guy. Life is good, and kind of um, really just kind of resonated with these two guys who started in college with a truck in there selling these t-shirts and this logo life is good kind of this positive message and i was like fuck yeah life is good i like this so i just kind of adopted it you know it's um, become your brand yeah it's just like life is good it is they're right fuck it i'll buy your i'll buy your hat and i'll wear it and um you know i just start like i think it was like i think like right after college started shaving my head and i was just like i'm gonna wear a hat you know when you you know like you become a hat guy you know I, I, if i don't completely keep it shiny and shaved down. I like wearing a hat and, and I think it looks good. And it's a, it's a good, uh, I'm a dad, you know, it's got the dad hat look, you know, so. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so weird when you say I'm a dad and you gotta wear the dad hat look. I just don't see the connection there. Go ahead. That one, okay. So every time I have a pimple, he will literally like practically force me down. <laughs> And he's like, you know, doctor's in session. Let me Dr. Pimple Popper. I'm a, I'm a doctor of small cuts, so, scrapes, and bruises. Small cuts, scrapes, and bruises. And he I think every dad is a doctor of cult, small cuts, scrapes, and bruises, or at least the mom is. Somebody, somebody in the family is the doctor of small cuts, scrapes, and bruises. And so when I scream, he gets mad at me. Like, you can handle this, whatever. Like, let me get there. And then I was like, no, 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 stop. It hurts too bad. And he's like, no. All right. Like, can't believe we're here talking about we'll pimples, but whatever. Okay, so <laughs> have, you both, have you both ever watched the show Dr. Pimple Popper? No. no. You got to watch that. it now. Now you got to watch it. Now we have to. Now we have to Dr. definitely. Pimple Popper. For no other reason, but you guys, you guys will be able to associate really well. Correct. All right. Correct. So he likes to pimp pop, uh, pop pimples. 
to the point where he literally jujitsu. Doctor. It's like a thing. I have a PhD. I have a doctor of small cut scripts. Here's a good one. Wait, are we talking about disgusting examples or or funny examples? Funny is disgusting, right? Funny. (laughs) Disgusting is kind of funny sometimes. Well, if I ever tell him he's got a booger, he will literally like pick it and try to put it on me. Yeah, that's true. So especially if it's in public, I'm like, I'm, I'm at a lot. I, I, I'm so confused because I'm like, okay, I don't want this guy to be out here. Like he's representing me and he's got like a booger hanging out of his nose or whatever. But if I tell him, he's going to grab it and he's going to try to put it on me. I'll be honest with you, Bill. You're kind of gross. <laughs> you be honest with me. What, what was that? I'll be honest, you're kind of gross. <laughs> yeah, I, I am, but I, you know, I think it's kind of, it's kind of good. I mean, won, like, me baby, it's it's a gift from deep inside of me to you, from me to you. I'm trying to give you my love. <laughs> On that note, I'm going to tell Here's Laura, do you ever have the desire to to do him too, where you've got like a little bug and you want to go up to him and say, here, a little payback? I mean, I'm de- I've definitely, let's, let's just put it this way. I've definitely paid him back. Yeah, she definitely paid him back. No way. Way. <laughs> she definitely has just blown we'll me just up. Hey. I think we'll save that for the next time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up. So this is the disgusting habits of Bill Perkins. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pimple Popper. Yeah. See you later. Right. Cheers. Bye, Larry. So Bye, Larry. I, think, I think that was good because I think we now know that you have an addiction with popping pimples. Do, do you do it to the daughters too? No, no. They would kill me. Crush me. <laughs> We get stabbed in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I got to tell you, um, getting to know you over the last year has been one of my favorite things. I think that you are a genuinely high character individual. You live your life by a set of codes that you actually follow through on. A lot of people say that they have these, these, these moral codes. You actually don't have to say them. You do them. You are a man of high character. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, and like, I, it hasn't always been that way for me, right? Like, it takes a while to build that up. Like, you gotta, you fall down, you get burned, you have to fall, lose your way, you, you become a victim, you tell, you got this victim story, and then, you know, you have to, um, you don't have to, but if you want to, you have to, like, kind of decide, decide what your priorities are, and then live by those things, and then just say, fuck it, the rest, and sometimes that, that comes at high consequences, and you can't be a victim, but, you know. We, we all do our best. We're all just human, right? Like I, I, I'm like, I am a, I've fucked up just as much as the next human being. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so uh, you got to get back. You got to get back up. You got to, you know, when you do wrong, you got to ask forgiveness and you got to forgive yourself. Because if you, if you shame yourself, like I'm very big, like, it, I, I don't know if you notice in my social media and stuff like that. Like I'll let people say that's a stupid idea or this dumb, I'll debate to, to the end. But I'm really against shaming people. Right, because shame is a, it, it, um, is powerful. And when you shame yourself, like when you say I am a bad person, then you wind up doing bad things because that's what bad, bad people do. They do these bad things. When you say I did a bad thing, right? That's different. That's external. It's like I did a bad thing. People do bad things. This is an instance I can correct, right? And so shame is uh, you're a bad person. Not shame is you did a bad thing, right? And so the only thing I don't tolerate. Uh, uh, one talking shit about my girl, and two, uh, uh, you know, kids and stuff like that. But one of one of I would say one of the things I don't tolerate is shaming. You know, it's just instant block, end of discussion, etc. Otherwise, I can have all the discourse in the world with anybody. I think you're pretty good about that too. I think uh, you're very like like our politics, yours and my politics probably are different in some ways, right. but in many ways they're probably aligned. But I've right. seen the way you've been in, in engaged with people about politics, which is a very explosive subject these days. Like we have we have stri- strong divide in this country about politics, but you've literally been able to have dialogue and discussion on both sides of the fence. Even when people get explosive, you're still like, yeah, you know, I get it. Yeah, yeah I think there's so much of a, of assumed attention and assumed, assumed intention with people's words. Right, so they they not really willing to debate, you know, the policy or the subject matter or whatever. They go straight in. You're an evil motherfucker, and that's why you want to do this, right? On both sides, and I'm like, no, he just he just said, I think this is a, like the words are very clear, and they, they're reading between. Oh my god, I, I hate to interject, but I gotta sh- st- share something with you. Do you know Jeremy Gardner? No. Great kid, mind is in the right place. Um, did really well in crypto. He has a, a, a new business now about skincare made man. 
love the kid dearly, just a great kid. So, but he's, he's clearly anti-Trump and I'm clearly pro-America. I, li- I like seeing America do well. I don't care who the president is. So, so yesterday he sends a tweet out about how great Obama's message was at the eulogy, how amazing the spe- you know, speaker he was, how awesome he was. And I wrote a reply saying, yeah, or, and, and he's like, uh, he mentioned something about Trump in the tweet, like, you know, unlike Trump. And I said, and now he, he was on autopilot. And I said, yeah, you know, he's a great speaker, one of the best orators of, of our time. When he speaks, people listen. He does an amazing job of doing that. And I just was complimenting it, but I didn't say the word Obama. So he comes back <laughs> with a tweet and he's like, how the fuck could you say that about Trump? He's just, he's the head of speakers. He's this, that, the other, that. And then I just sent him a little trip. I was, I was talking about Obama. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, this, this is this, you know, it, it, it we, we've, we've lost that uh, ability to like just, we're just, people are trigger happy. Oh they my God. And that was funny because here's the, like, I'm actually trying to say, you know what, you're right. You're trying to compliment them, or you're even, agree- I've seen people agree, and people are talking past each other. So I, I think like if you can, you know, say, okay, there, there is, there is an element though, I think there is an element. Of people out there who are trolling you know and and frustrating people right oh yeah on on purpose and so pretty much so and you don't know if so so, and and, you know i I treat the troll i'll be honest i think trump trolls america every single day (laughs) i think i think he wakes up with a plan to literally fuck with the media just to put them on end you know and i I try and give a reason rational uh, uh uh response to even the troll things so other people get you know the third party reading this thread or looking at it gets value out of it including the troll i mean some i mean i can get triggered just like the next person but generally i i try and not to fiercely tweet then and go okay how what's the what, what's my response to this where, where do i fall whatever you know you know uh when when you were uh, tweeting the other day i had to get you on today to tell you something linearly in common that we had a little bit so uh it's i think i, I got to tell you the story before we run out of time i was 18 years old and i was selling timeshare for three months now yeah. back in the day timeshare was like a big deal you know people it would force people to go on vacations and i was an 18 year old kid and i was like number one number one and number two in sales but i wasn't like i thought i was supposed to make a lot of money when you're number one out of like 250 salespeople. Right. And it wasn't, it was like, you know, 1800 bucks, three, three grand, two grand. I'm like uh, this, I'm not missing something here. So one night I got this couple in front of me and we're just kicking it off. We're getting along great. And the guy leans forward and he says, listen, I'm going to buy this, but not because my wife wants it. I actually like you. He goes, have you ever thought about becoming a commodity broker? And I'm 18 years old. I'm like, what's commodities? <laughs> right, right. But all he said was a guy like you, could make over a hundred thousand dollars a year selling commodities. You were like, goodbye. <laughs> I, I literally heard the angels singing at that moment. Oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Where do I apply? And he's like, you yeah. should apply at first commodity corporation of Boston. And I'm sure they would hire you. I worked there myself. Literally next morning, <laughs> I call him up. I get on the phone and uh, I said, Hey, I'm calling about the position and blah, blah, blah. They put me through to this guy that manages the Chicago office. His name's Peter Marin. He's six foot six, monster of a human being. And literally, he interviews me over the phone. And I'm literally standing up. I'm pacing back and forth. My grandmother's in the house with me. She's literally going to hit me with a wooden spoon if I don't calm down. I'm literally trying to avoid my grandmother and answer this guy's questions at <laughs> performance. She's hitting me with a spoon and he's drilling me with questions. I'm crushing the interview over the phone, crushing it. Right. At the end of the interview, he's like, listen. I'd like to schedule you for an interview. I'd like, we're going to bring in Brian Sharp, by the way, Hotep Jesus, uh, as a little transition. I think you guys will connect really well. But I'm going to finish this story. Hotep uh, Jesus, meet Bill Perkins. Or maybe not. Anyway, yeah, I mean, it'll yeah. take it, The world is working. Take a little bit. Yeah, it comes in. Tech, go ahead. So he's literally at the uh, end of the interview questions. And Hotep. Yo. Bill Perkins, Hotep What's going Jesus. going on, Hotep? Hotep, Hotep. He's to the family. <laughs> So Hotep, I'm in the midst of a story. We'll get you in in a second. So I'm literally doing this interview and the guy's like, okay, when can we schedule an interview, a face-to-face? 
I'm like, I could be there today. I lived on the South side to take the train. Literally I'm at 209 West Jackson, uh, the board of trade building. I'm like I could be there in an hour. He's like, great. He's like, by the way, how old are you? And I didn't think nothing of it. So I just told him the truth. I'm like, I'm 18. Literally I could hear his heart stop and the change in tone was deafening. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm 18. He's like, listen, I'm sorry. He goes, um, He's like, I can't, I can't, I can't have you come in an interview. He goes, you sound great. Just, you know, call back in a couple of years when you're done with college. I'm like, what? I'm not going to college. <laughs> and he, I'm like, you just told me for a half hour. I'm great. I go, what happened? I go, is there an age requirement? He's like, oh, no. Man. He's like, you're 18. I can't hire you. I'm like, why? He goes, you don't know anything about sales. Now, just so for the record, I read Think and Grow Rich and everything I could ever get my hands on when it came to sales at the age of 18. When yeah. he said that to me, this monster Duracell battery just came off my shoulder. I just right. knocked it over. I was like, all right, motherfucker. That I know I know. So right. I, I'm like, I'm like, listen, I know a lot about sales. I, he goes, if you know so much about sales, close me on that interview. And I'm thinking, I've got the phone in my hand, my, my grandmother beating me with a wooden spoon. <laughs> this guy's fucking telling me I can't come in for an interview. I'm like, I'll be there in an hour. I hung up. He didn't say no. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's awesome <laughs> so I, I grab my shit i get out the door i go to the train boom hour later i'm down at 209 west jackson get upstairs i sit down there's this girl her name is lydia i remember she was the sweetest uh, no lisa she was the sweetest human being in the world to me i said i'm here for the interview with peter Marin. she goes yeah he told us you might show up he's not going to interview you i said just tell him i'm here i just want five minutes i go if i if i can't get the job after that interview i'll leave i'll walk away I literally sat in the waiting room from about 9.30 till 12.30 in the afternoon. I read everything about First Commodity Corporation Boston, read everything about sugar futures, soybean, treasury bonds, everything that Lisa would give me, I would just absorb and read. Literally, he kept telling her to tell me to go home. I kept telling her, listen, I got nowhere to go. I accidentally forgot my wallet. I didn't tell her this. I forgot my wallet in the hurry of it all. And my buddy gets off, got, got off work at five. So he was giving me a ride back home because I didn't have enough money to get back on the train. So I, I literally was stuck there. And I said to myself, it's an air conditioned office. I got a chair. This girl's sweet. I can read some shit. And at five o'clock, I get a ride home from my buddy. So this guy literally thought I was staying there all day because I was persistent. Part of the problem was I was persistent. but I didn't have a ride back home. <laughs> exactly. so I'm, like, I'm like, I'm staying. But it turns out there's only one way out of the office. So where I was sitting, everyone at lunchtime had to come by. So literally he comes through the door and he's getting ready to go to lunch. And Lisa's like, that's him. Cause I didn't know what he looked like. And I just stood up. I said, Peter, it's Chris. And I reach out my hand and he's like, are you still here? I'm like, give me five minutes. I promise I will leave. If you just give me five minutes, he goes, you're the most persistent human being. Come with me. So we go into his office, go down the hallway. He skips lunch. We talk for an hour. The guy's in love with me. But he brings up the age thing at the at the end. He's like, listen, I'll be honest with you. I love you, but I just can't hire you. I said, why? He goes, it wouldn't look right. And I just lost it at that point. And so, I, so I, I'm 18 and a little over aggressive. And he had this big glass table. And he's like six foot six, but he had this big fancy glass table. And I said, fine. And I just got up and I hit his glass table. But I didn't realize the glass table was on these two pins like this. So if you hit the front, it actually slides everything up and comes back. Oh my God. <laughs> so I said, fine. I get up, the glass comes forward, phone is everywhere, shit's blowing over. I'm in the hallway and I spin one of his mirror, his paintings on the side like this. Here's a six foot six guy, fuming, comes flying out in the hallway. It's like, get back in this office. I'm like, no. He's like, get back in there, screaming and yelling at me. And this, this desk is on the floor and I'm like, hey, I, I'm trying to help pick it up, but it won't slide back on. He's like, leave it alone. He's like, sit down. I'm like, no. He's like, sit down. He's like, no. I'm like, sit down. He's like, no. And I'm like, I'm like no. And he's like, he's like, why won't you sit down? I'm like, I think you're going to hit me. He's like, I'm not going to hit you. <laughs> so he, he asked Lisa, the girl at the front, to come help him with this big piece of glass. She can't pick it up. He's you're like, I don't want to get hit. You're like kind of like this. pick it up. I finally help him get it back on the desk. He's sitting down, mess what playing with his hair. He's all pissed off. He's like, I can't believe I'm gonna do this. I can't believe I'm gonna do this. And I'm like, holy fuck, I think he's gonna hit me. He's like, one chance. <laughs> That's funny. one chance. You get one chance to pass the test. You take it in three weeks. You don't take the course. I'm not putting you up. 
So literally, I didn't realize this series three test. I mean, you know, yeah. I was street smart, but I was not book smart. And I had three weeks to take a test that most brokers took in like six weeks, but it was coming up. He just wanted me to fail and get the fuck out of Dodge. Plus, he wouldn't even give me a booth on the floor. He gave me a booth in a closet. They literally took the closet apart and said, here, here's a desk, a chair. I don't want to see you. Right. So there's one old guy, Arthur Barbado. He sees me at like nine o'clock at night reading these books. And, you know, it's like hieroglyphics to me. And yeah. it, he's like, listen, Chris, if you want to pass this test, the best chance you have, write things down. You'll remember them. So literally, day before I'm ready to take the test, I go into Arthur's office. I said, listen, no matter what happens today, you give me the best advice in the world. I dropped 17 yellow pads of paper written front and back on his desk. I said, this is everything I've read over the last three weeks. I said, if I, if I don't pass this test, I'd be shocked. So I go to take the test, series three exam. And it's like the centralized testing place. And you go right. in, they separate you and they tell you the rules. You can't cheat. You can't use anything under your calculator, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like ready. I'm like juiced up. I'm ready. So you get two and a half hours to take the test. Bing, 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 bing. Like everything was coming clear as day to me. Bing, 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 bing. Finally, you get to the last question. It's an hour and a half into it. I get an hour left. And I'm like, what? How am I fucking answering these questions so fast? So then it's like, you know, press, press this to, to get the result or do this to go back and check your answers. I'm like, fuck, I'm not going to change anything. I hit the button. 73. 70 was Bing, the you're in. You're I'm in. Bing, I'm in. <laughs> you're in. Like, I literally stand up. I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> there's a bunch of like suits guys, you know. Running yeah, yeah, standing up. around. Like, they're, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I passed. I'm like, how'd you pass? I'm like, I'm done. They're like, how are you done? I'm like, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so literally the heavy set lady comes in. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I passed. Give me this on a piece of paper. I need it. She's like, no, we send it to your office. No, I need, a, I need, give me this. Now this is the <laughs> where you could take pictures of shit. <laughs> so like this heavy set lady, she's like, no worry. You know, your office will get notification in a couple of days that you pass. I'm like, no, I need this now. They won't let me back in the office. <laughs> they have every, <laughs> they have intentions of freaking me out. <laughs> and he might hit me. <laughs> so she writes on a piece of paper, this person passed. You know, if you have questions, call me. So, <laughs> So I get in a cab. I get this Pakistani guy, nothing against Pakistani people. I'm literally telling him I just passed the hardest test I've ever taken. He's like, Sir, I do not understand. I'm like, okay, just drive. Get me there. <laughs> I get there. I literally fly up the elevator, go in. Peter's doing the, the meeting with the brokers. Hey, rah, rah, we're going to sell sugar today, blah, blah, blah. Sell the shit out of it, whatever. I get in there and I'm like, I passed. He's like, how could you pass? Like, you, should, you should still be taking the test. Passed, finished, done. Here, call the lady. <laughs> he calls the lady literally literally the lady's like yes he passed he's like do you actually work for the cftc she's like yes i do yeah i'm gonna verify this first because i can't believe this is true literally verifies that i get my series three moral of the story is don't ever give up yeah that's a great story that that's it's so funny the mind of an 18 year old coming in that 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 passion that aggression that's awesome oh. So the, there's some things behind the scenes I had to tell you too. Um, even though I was working my ass off, I had like these big dreams. I had a, I had a goal board, a vision board. I still do it to, to this my day. I'll, I'll tell you another story much faster. When I was a kid in Chicago, there was a pizza company that did a fundraiser to sell pizzas at the end of the school year. And I didn't have a bike. And I wanted a Schwinn banana bike. Do you know what a banana bike was? Yep. Like the big shit. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the handles like this. and the Oh, like fuck this. yeah. And I wanted to get the flag on top. I wanted to put a baseball card in. I wanted to trick that bike out like never before. Literally, they gave us a sheet of paper with volleyball set, radio, all the shit prizes. In the middle of it all was a Schwinn banana seat bike. I sold a lot of pizzas. Now, this was at the end of the school year in May in Chicago. Little three packs of pizzas. They didn't expect anybody to ever do what I did. I literally took that sheet of paper. I crossed out the bike. I, I, I won enough points to get every prize on the sheet of paper. They literally brought the president of the company out to literally give me the honor and bring the toys. But they had to also bring out a freezer truck. So I, uh, I was always driven in life to achieve. Freezer truck? Uh, oh, I'll, yeah. Yeah. I'll get to that in a second. You'll, you'll start realizing pizzas, hot summer sun and squirrels, yeah. bad yeah, yeah. situation. So, and Chicago has rats too, by the way, squirrels, rats, they're both about the same. 
So at three o'clock when I got out of school, I had to actually go deliver 600 three packs of pizzas to people in a four square mile radius block. So the pizza truck guy was going to follow me so I could literally go door to door and deliver pizzas. Well, not everybody gets home at three o'clock in the afternoon. So what do I do? I shove partly frozen pizzas, three packs in their doorway so that they can get their pizzas. Turns out that wasn't such a good idea on a hot summer. No, I don't think so. Chicago. <laughs> People came home to squirrels, rats in their doorways. <laughs> Long story short, they got a coupon for a free three pack at the local grocery store. But, but the, the complaints we got were epic. What is wrong with you people? I had a, yeah. I had a pile of city rats at my door. How old were you when this happened? I was nine years old. I went, awesome. Yeah, I was that in That is Chicago. an awesome story. I literally, I literally got the bike, uh, the, the, we had a volleyball set that yep. we set up in the backyard, the whole neighborhood like came over. I had, I gave away some of the stuff too, not because not I wanted to, but because my grandmother said it was the right thing to do. Like when she started giving shit away that I like earned, I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, it's the right thing to do. You don't need it. I'm like, oh, okay. I think you just got uh, kids who watch this a prank to do. Now they're going to start stuffing food and people <laughs> stuff and putting rats in Chicago neighborhoods. Do not do that in Chicago. The rats and the squirrels are epic in size. <laughs> right. So Hotep, well, go ahead. You were going to say you got a fly bill? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say. Hotep, Bill just launched probably one of the life altering books of all time, Die With Zero. Are you familiar with what? That? Die with zero. Die with zero. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. It's a it's it's a shocking title, but it's really about living. It's all about living your best life. It's all about optimizing your life and getting the most you can out of it, and and having a mental model to do it. But I gotta I gotta bust out of here, so I'm gonna let you guys chop it up, go on to the next subject. But you know you can you can fill them in on. I think you kind of you got the message on die with zero, so you can fill them in on it, and um you guys have fun. I'll I'll be watching. All Bill, right. uh, tell Laura it was fun bringing her in. I'm so okay. glad we had this time. We'll do it again sometime. You should jump, somehow hook up with Hotep. He's got a great I'll following. I'll follow you on Twitter. I'm out he there is, in the Twitterverse. He's, it literally, up. He's, he's literally the kind of insight that is refreshing. You'll, you'll literally be mind blown. Okay. I'm on it. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Peace out, guys. Cheers, brother. Hotep Jesus. What's up, sir? How you doing, buddy? Life is good. Life is good. good. Life is good. You like my pizza story? Yo, I like the first story. I'm like, yo, I think I'm about to just like retell that story to my kids and say I, it came from an ancient monk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I don't think I could play that out the same way today in this current environment than I did a long time ago. Mm. I don't know how that works out if you like, you know, destroy some guy's desk and I think security somewhere along the way is, these days just tosses you out of the building. In 2020, yeah, you're definitely you're definitely gonna have a charge, <laughs> sir, sir, sir. You're being charged with antifa vandalism. You can't, you can't come in and vandalize some poor guy's glass desk. But now let's yeah. be honest with you. I don't know a lot about engineering, but having two little points of structure on a big piece of glass doesn't seem like it's engineered wisely. Yeah, it seems like it's it definitely more for style than practicality. It was definitely for style. <laughs> How you been, man? I don't know, man. You know, I'm I'm just staying busy. You know, um, just got a 110k uh, investment for one of my AI companies. Which one? Uh, Wazo, Wazo. We do uh, video surveillance and video, okay. video, video, uh, video monitoring analytics telemetry uh for the retail space and for corporate nothing in the cloud everything's happening right there inside the wazo box um so yeah life is good <laughs> i can't imagine in this day and age that's not a must-have for almost every business these days uh i would say so too i would say so too a bit of a hurdle with covid you know, not a lot of happening in the retail space, but I think this is a right time to kind of get that stuff in, implemented and tested and going. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely something that's going to become normal. Yeah. You know, COVID ends November 4th, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to a screeching halt. <laughs> if it doesn't get delayed. <laughs> you know, you got to understand the, I think Trump, 
at his age and the amount of Adderall he's taking, he wakes up in the morning so mentally sharp. He says to himself, how can I fuck with the media today? I wouldn't put it past him. I really wouldn't. Cause I think he said to himself the other day, let's postpone the election. See how that plays out. Right. Like, and cause they take every little piece of bait and just, and just run with it. It's like they're, they're rats and he's sprinkling the cheese. <laughs> and, and then you see like the CNN rat and then you see the MSNBC rats and they're like, Oh my God, let's get the cheese. <laughs> and he's just literally laughing his ass off going, man, look at those rats. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know. He always seems to be one step ahead. So far. But I think you called him Teflon Don, didn't you? Teflon Don. <laughs> can't can't touch him. So you've got the surveillance company. What else you got going on? Coinbits app. Automatic Bitcoin investing. That's got to be good. Yeah, things are happy over there. We have uh, close to a million assets under management. Um, our customers are happy. No complaints. Um Gifitize. That's a common tool amongst the influencers. I actually love the Gifitize stuff you're doing. Okay. It's it's like, uh, who's the company that got acquired recently? Giphy, uh, Tenor. Yeah, what did yeah. they get uh, what did they get acquired for? A billion? Yeah, over a billion. The over. unicorn. Yeah. I mean, people say that that's one of the most used search engines every day. Absolutely. Is Absolutely. It, is it similar I'm, to that? Yeah, I mean... You know, things are great when people start plugging into your API. When that's happening, you know, you got the big dogs plugging into your API um, because you have this massive library of content, uh, I think puts you in a really good place. And I think that's what they were able to leverage um, popularity. And like you said, place where you search and had an archive of past and present GIFs, right? Um, Givitize, what we do is or actually the beginning stage is helping people actually get some of that content from Twitter because it doesn't allow you to download it to the iPhone platform, the iOS platform. So it's allowing people to do that. That's why influencers love it. They love to repurpose the videos that tend to go viral on Twitter, and get access to it and pull it into maybe YouTube land. Uh, so it's a useful tool and we have our ambitions for an archive library of sorts. Uh, in the future. So um, things are great there. I'm working with another AI company trying to develop something interesting and cool in the way of deep fakes. Um, but yeah, staying busy, man. You know, it's funny. Everyone was so worried about deep fakes during the election. I almost we think like a week or two before the election, we're going to see all the deep fakes. <laughs> deep fakes come out. Everyone was so worried. But I think everyone's like sandbagging their deep fake stuff for like the last week because I think they're worried that it's not going to have the same effect. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, deep fakes are going to be very interesting. Um, I think we're going to see Amazon start controlling some of that space. That's that's one of my predictions. Amazon and eBooks. You know. Um, Imagine if uh, your favorite actor read your ebook to you. Interesting. Yeah. That was <laughs> like I could see that. I could see The Rock getting a lot of play with kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's dangerous though. I think it's a dangerous side to it. You know. Hold on one second, Brock. Brock. Yes. You got the dialing info. Dude, just jump in. I'm live right now. <laughs> Brock will be joining us in a second. Yeah. Presidential candidate Brock Pierce. Oh, dope. Yeah, I don't know. You know, when I thought of that idea, I actually scared myself and I said, damn, like, when I want somebody else to have access to my voice, when I want my voice to be digitized, because you never know what people could do with that, you know? Oh, there's going to be some evil shit that they do. Yeah. yeah. When, uh, when, when you see people in the world today, technology can be used for good and can be used for bad. But overwhelmingly, bad somehow just takes over and controls shit. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, deciding what is inevitable and what's the timetable on when that manifests. And what do you do in the meantime? 
you know, your voice becomes IP, I guess, right? And everyone's going to have to have some sort of voice fingerprint cataloged. Is that really, even possible? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's where we're going to go. So I'm going to let you take over when Brock jumps on. And- okay. We're going to see what kind of mischief you can get into. What is Brock, about, what's Brock up to? I think we're, I think we're going to find out. I know that uh, he's passionate about this presidential run. I know that, uh, are you familiar with Brittany Kaiser? Nope. Who's so that? Brittany was, uh, Brittany was uh, involved in the Trump campaign with uh, 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 Cambridge Analytica. You remember Cambridge Analytica? Yeah. People that had all the data. Exactly. So, she was, she was an employee of Cambridge Analytica. She came out as a whistleblower against them. Right. Uh, she talked about all the things that they were doing to manipulate data. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting road, roadmap that uh, she's had. And she's okay. seen up close how Facebook really controlled the, the election of 2016 to a massive degree. And I think now even Facebook didn't understand how much data they were giving up to the Trump campaign. They spent, Trump campaign spent one-tenth of the money that Hillary Clinton spent, yet they got 100x response. Because of the data? Um, it was because of the way they, they used the data. It was a way, because of the way Brad Parscale, I mean, they used memes. Well, well, well the, 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 way, the way that the Facebook algorithm set up, if you're popular, the thing's going to go viral, right? So, uh, I don't. I don't know if it's due to some campaign efforts as it is to his popularity online. It's true. Brock Pierce running for POTUS. Meet Hotep Jesus. What's up, bro? How are you? Life is well. Life is well. How are you? Grateful. Uh, this this running for president thing is like more than a full time job. So. <laughs> Yo, who you running? You running this year right now? Yeah, I'm in the uh, the current election that will take place November third. What, what party? Independent. Independent. Interesting. And 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 why are you running? Well, um, I'd say uh, I'm a father of two young girls, and I take a look at the state of our nation, and I am very very concerned about our collective future. I think that we have very real existential threats that not just threaten our potential future as a nation, but our existence as a species on this planet. And I think we need another choice. I think that uh, part of the problem is partisan politics. I think that we've been trapped in this duopoly for far too long. And, uh, and I believe there's uh, an opportunity to make a real difference in the world. Who are you right now? You're like in a spaceship. <laughs> Something like um, actually, I'm in Washington, D.C., in the top of a school that was built in 1894. And so this is like the turret. It looks like an old castle. It's on Maryland, right in the heart of Capitol Hill. Uh, mm. And it's called the Pierce School. And my last name is, is Pierce. It's named after the 14th president of the United States, Franklin Pierce, the only Pierce or president to come from uh, New Hampshire, uh, the state of live free or die. Is that your family? Uh, I'm sure I have a, a genealogist looking back uh, to see if we have a connection to that particular uh, uh, line of pierces. Uh, I can't confirm yet. Oh, okay. Dope, dope. All right. So you're running and, and you think there's, there's some problems with the country, right? Well, what, what problems do you see with the country? Well, first and foremost, technology is one. Our leadership doesn't really have an understanding of technology. And I think it's indisputable that technology has changed all of our lives. I mean, just take a look at social media, for example, and the impact that's having on democracy. And I feel like our leadership is really trying to manage these issues through the rear view mirror, you know, kind of after the fact. I think that we need more foresight, more vision and understanding the road ahead so that we can better navigate it. And so technologies like gene editing, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, the list goes on and on and on. I think that we need people that are in touch with the present reality of the world 
in which we live so that we can ensure that technology is a tool, because it is a tool to enhance our lives and to enhance our systems. Well, I think that we have, we, have, we have other issues as well that are significant right now. I don't know if you saw, but 30 million Americans are basically struggling to eat. You know, this is, uh, this is all news in the last 24 hours that you're starting to see problems. 10% of the population can't put sufficient food on the table right now. We've got unemployment. What do you think the cause of that is? Uh, unemployment and the fact that people can't go to work. I mean, right now, more than anything, this is one of the ripple effects of COVID and shutting down the economy. You know, there were a lot of people that were struggling before COVID. Now you add this sort of event where you can't work, um, you know, businesses shutting down. You know, they weren't really talking about it. All you heard was wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. We're not talking about the fact that the World Food Program is suggesting that 132 million people are now at risk of starving in the developing world because of the, the shutdown of basically the agricultural industry. We are just now starting to see the ripple effects of this that are beyond just the risk of the virus itself. What and do you so, think, about, what do you think yeah. about America's first line doctors? I mean, I'm so grateful for our uh, first responders that are there on the front line, uh, a, a, a assisting you know those people that are putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, well, I'm talking uh, about the doctors the other day that had the summit on COVID, the ones that were um, saying that uh, hydroxychloroquine in conjunction with ZPAC and zinc is uh, a cure uh, for COVID. Did you see that? I, yeah, I'm not sure they say it's a cure. I think they say that it's if you if you're on that regimen, you can't. It, it be, it's very difficult to get COVID, um, but I think it might also be used as a as a treatment. I, I think, doctor, I'm not an I'm not an expert in this area, so by no means is this medical advice. But I'm a I'm a free thinker, right? This is part of the reason why I believe we should all be independents, even if you always vote Democrat or always vote Republican. The idea of following people blindly, I think is a big mistake. And the idea of saying I'm an independent, you know, sovereign being, and I am going to think for myself and I am going to choose for myself what, you know, whatever path I want to go down. I'm always open-minded to these ideas. Uh, and I, I tend to, to discount what I hear on the media or from the media, not to say that the media doesn't have an important role to play in educating us. I mean, I think, I think Denzel Washington said it best. He said, if you don't read the news, you know, if you don't follow the news, you're uninformed. But if you do follow the news, you're misinformed. And it's uh, <laughs> it's one of those. Um, yeah. What 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 do we do? And um, what what is your what is your professional career look like? Can you paint that picture for me? You know. Yeah. So I, I I started working at the age of three, and so I've been a professional pretty much my whole life. I started out as an actor. And so uh, uh, I made a lot of commercials and did like print advertisement modeling things as a kid. And then I made my first movie at the age of 10, which was called The Mighty Ducks. Uh, I played young Gordon Bombay, the, the missing of the shot that opens up the movie and sets the premise for that whole storyline. The movie I'm probably best known for is I started a movie called First Kid, where I played the son of the president of the United States and Sinbad was my uh, So I knew you looked familiar. I'm looking yeah. at your face like, oh, who is this dude, Joe? <laughs> so I, I started out working my whole life. I mean, I've lived a very professional life, but I, I decided at 16, and this, so this is 1996, 1997, that technology, specifically the internet, was going to change the world. And so I decided that I wanted to be a part of that, and I wanted to become an internet entrepreneur, not having any idea how to do that, but I started my first business at 16, was running that or helping to run that through 17 and 18, raised $88 million to build what you would think of as YouTube today. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people credit us with having been the inventors of this idea of distributing video over the internet and creating original programming. Uh, the problem was we were too early. You know, uh, High-speed internet took a long time to roll out. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I started building uh, my next set of businesses uh, in 2000, 2001, focused on virtual worlds so if you've heard of things like World of Warcraft or Second Life, I became the main market maker of those digital economies. I built up a supply chain of 400,000 people that played video games professionally to mine digital currencies. That was principally out of China. I was, we were PayPal's largest merchant for years. We were instrumental in the launching of Alipay. I hold two ambassadorship titles in South Korea today, honorary uh, in nature. 
And so did a lot of business in the virtual world uh, throughout my 20s. The last decade has principally been in things like Bitcoin and blockchain. I'm the, uh, uh, the chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation, which is uh, an elected position, more uh, a title than probably anything significant to this day in age, but uh, I was one of the uh, uh, founding, basically chairman of MasterCoin where we invented the ICO, it's changing capital formation. Uh, one of the founders of Tether where we put the US dollar on the blockchain, that's doing $10 trillion a year of transactional volume today. One of the founders of Blockchain Capital, the first venture fund that's funded most of the companies in that space. Um, started BCAP, invented the first security token, which is changing the way that stocks and bonds are settled. So I've always been on the forefront of technology as someone that doesn't look at the status quo or the world as it exists today and confined by that. I'm always seeing beyond that that exists and envisioning uh, you know, where we're going. Mm. And so I think that my background as a small business person creating things out of nothing, sometimes great things, um, understanding the forefront of where technology is taking us, uh, I think is, uh, uh, is important. And I, I care a great deal about this country. Um, and so I'm, I'm committed uh, over the long haul uh, to doing all that I can. And uh, the point that I would make for most people is if you said, okay, well, you're an independent, you know, like you have no chance of winning. Why would I bother a vote for you as a wasted vote? I would say uh, uh, something that has been, re again, I think outside of the box. I, I, I'm not limited by the, the confines of the world as it exists today. And so I, I sit down with these big political strategists and they're like, so uh, what are you gonna do? I explain a couple of things and their jaws drop. They're like, who are you? I go, well, I'm not, I'm not from the system. I see the world differently. And so the strategy is this. Did you know that you don't have to win the election to become president? That's the first premise that you have to like reveal. And people are like, huh? They, they, they start scratching their head like, what, what are you talking about? So to, to win the election, you need to win a majority of the electoral college vote. Key word right. being the majority. So right. what happens in a two party system if there was a tie? Neither party would get a majority. This is what happened in the year 1800 in Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. Or if a third party were to exist, or a fourth. And if we win one state as a third party, if we win one state, it's possible that no one will win in this election. If we're to win three states, it becomes likely that no one will win in this election. So our objective is to win in three states. So what happens if no one wins the election? So then the top three candidates are taken and given to the House of Representatives and the House of Representatives chooses the president. Every time this has ever happened, they've always chosen the third place candidate or the person with the least amount of states to be president. And so I could envision a, a scenario where the Republicans electors would have a very difficult time choosing the Democratic candidate. And I could envision the Democratic electors having a hard time choosing the Republican candidate, certainly in this very polarized, divisive um, situation we're in. And it's possible they could choose the compromise candidate that is running on a platform of reuniting uh, this country. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the Democrats hold the House? So it, it doesn't work that way when it comes to this decision. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it, each state gets one vote. And so it's 50 votes, all states are equal. And so it's, it's, this is the only scenario that I'm aware of where the house actually functions in this way. So it's not the house as you think of it, it's the house, but with each state and the electors in each state having one vote. I've ran, we've run now every data sort of analysis and it, if, if we win three states, it's almost, it's gonna be a, it, we'll have a house that basically is in a stalemate. That's interesting. Um, and so when I show this to the political strategists, they're like, who are you? I go, well, I, I study history and I actually look at things like our constitution and read our amendments and I understand the rules of the game. Yeah, I love it. All right. So how does uh, Kanye play into all of that? Is he's, he's, he's running independence. So he's splitting your votes, right? Well, I think that, I think it's a wonderful thing to see. I think that uh, we need, I think we desperately need another choice in this country. Um, I, I'm, I, I think that the main problem that we have in the country right now is that we have, we're, we're confined to this two party partisan system. And especially as it becomes more and more polarized, the left won't even have conversations with the right and vice versa. Like people won't even sit down at a table 
to engage in civil discourse. Yeah. I mean, that's a re- that, that, that leads to a potential very scary outcome. You right. know, we have to be willing to engage in conversation with people that we disagree with. And at the end of that conversation, we can agree to disagree, but at least we've learned the perspective of the other party. And through that learning, we can hopefully find a compromise or a path forward. Right now, uh, it, 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 I'm just really concerned about where things are going. And so I think that anyone that has the courage, and Kanye clearly has a lot of courage, to run for president has got to be one of the most uh, difficult things that someone could do in their life. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are asking, you are asking for pressure like to be come down on you to have every decision you've ever made in your life scrutinized under a magnifying glass so uh i i'm i'm really proud of kanye for having the courage that it takes to step up uh uh, for for such a mission and uh you know here to support him in any way i can brock what was the first thing i said to you that weekend you were telling me you were going to announce it i i I think you said are you crazy (laughs) well maybe that but i also said that this is literally and I've known you for a while. This is literally the riskiest thing you've ever done. Mm. Well, I, I've gone through my life taking massive risks uh, and it's usually worked out. Actually, it's almost always worked out because I'm just that tenacious. And keep in mind, I'm 39 years old. I turned 40 in November. And so I have time on my side, whether it's 2020, 2024, 2028, we, and I don't mean me, we will eventually win. Here's a question I wanted to ask. Sorry, Hotep, let me just get this one in. I wanted to ask you this and I, I want to get it out there. And I think it's an important thing. When will we see term limits for some politicians like congressmen and senators so that we don't have these really old politicians that are literally past past their date like literally literally yesterday AOC or maybe a day before was tweeting out that she had to explain uh what was it twitch or yeah I think she had to explain twitch to some of the congress people they didn't know what twitch was like we we have some politicians that are anchored deeply into their congressional power for so long that it's not healthy for the country. So when do, when do term limits become a reality? And how does that happen? Well, I, I, I think that we would be well served if we had term limits. I mean, our founding fathers viewed uh, taking these positions in government as an act of civil service. Like the key word there being service. You know, I live my life in service. I've done all sorts of things in my life. I've been blessed with abundance as a result of that. And, and, and less so than a, an abundance of, call it resources, an abundance of skills, like an abundance of skills. I've built things over and over and over all over the world. And I think that we would be far better served with non-career politicians and people that have been successful doing whatever it is that they're doing from all walks of life in this country, actually stepping in to serve their country for a term or two if they can afford to, and then go back to work. I think that one of the problems we have with career politicians, and I'm not saying that you know we don't need people that, have, that are serving in, in, in career capacities. This is not a, uh, a criticism specifically against any one group, but one of the problems you have is when this is your career, you are not by nature a civil servant because it's your career, it's your job. By nature, you are serving yourself. Now, hopefully you do a good job of that and understand the significance of your constituents and you're acting in their best interest. But by nature, when it's your career, you know, you should be putting yourself first. That's how, you're, that's how we're successful in our careers. And hopefully we have more people signing up to serve in government where they are, they are truly putting the people first. And, um, and why, I, hope, why are- I hope that we get more people like that serving. What- why are term limits a concern? So the, the idea that people can just keep serving in a role over and over and over again until they are, you know, it's, it's, but what I if you have somebody want, that's, think, what if you have somebody that's good at the job though? Wouldn't you want somebody like that to stay in position of power <laughs> as yes, opposed it, to subbing it, them out for somebody who. Yeah. So I'm not it. saying it's all, it's, it, it's, these are not like, because I mean, here's, here's, here's what could happen with term limits, right? You say, all right, we're going to have term limits, right? 
technically I don't have to brand as people anymore. I would just brand as a, let's call it a syndicate, right? And anybody my syndicate chooses, I can pluck from this crew and I can, can still control the election, right? So I can circumvent your, your, your term limits, you know, by rebranding. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so again, these are, this is why there's, there's never an easy answer to this stuff. And so the, the good news is, yes, if you've got a really good person, you could you, hopefully if they're benevolent and actually serving and doing a good job, yeah, you want that person to serve as long as they're willing. Um, and the other end of the spectrum is you get people that maybe are not well suited to serve, but because they're the incumbent, they just end up in that position over and over again. And I, I, I don't know. Have... Isn't that isn't that a fault of their competition to motivate enough people to show up at the booths? Because the, the biggest problem is voter participation, period. Absolutely. And that this is where hopefully, you know, uh, between Kanye and myself, we can hopefully rally up some of the youth that is normally not participating in the ways that they usually would. Remember, we, the, 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 the silent majority, you know, actually controls our politi political outcome. And when the silent majority makes their voices heard, everything is going to change. Yeah. And so, like, let's get that word out. Let's get that, let's get that, let's make sure that the silent majority realizes that their voices matter and that their voices count. I think too many people in this country just don't realize how much they matter, that the future is going to happen to us or the future is going to happen with us. You know, we need to like basically rise up and ensure that we're creating the future that we all want to live in. And that doesn't mean we all have to agree on what that looks like, but if you don't get involved, Others are going to make the decision for you. And if you're not happy today with the state of things, I know I'm not, like if ever there was a reason to like get involved, it's now. This It really feels to me like this is the 11th hour. It feels like this decade is going to be our defining moment. And the future of humanity, I think depends on the decisions we make over these next few elections. Brock, what do you think about some of the economic decisions that have been made over the last four months, uh, literally the printing of trillions of U.S. dollars? Well, it's not just a th an issue here in the U.S. I think central banks have printed over 75 trillion collectively, globally. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's uh, you can rob Peter to pay Paul, and I understand in this situation with COVID and unemployment and all of the things, um, we had governments around the world had to do something, right? Something had to be done. Um, you know, was it was it the right decision? Would I have done things differently? Yes, I would have. I would have done more to put money directly in the hands of Americans in need right now, and I would have done more to support small business than big business. So that's where I would have probably differed. And I'd even go so far as to say that. Um, uh, we need something like a universal basic income. I prefer the term universal earned income because it's just, we've, we're going to have 30 plus percent unemployment. You got people, Americans that can't feed themselves. And then take a look at what technology is doing to the labor market, right? You've got three, three and a half million truck drivers in the United States, all making reasonably good salaries. Driverless trucks, you know, or driverless cars, this technology is already on the road. Like it's literally on the road already. A lot of those jobs are going to be gone over the next four years. And so as the world is changing rapidly, we have to understand that we have to give Americans the ability to breathe, you know, the ability to eat and the ability to have shelter as they start to figure out how they're gonna reskill themselves, what jobs they wanna take on. And I believe if we manage this correctly, we could see a, like a renaissance emerge because technology has so enhanced our lives where I live to work, I love to serve. A lot of people work to live. And when you give people the ability to breathe and really reflect on like what they care about, what matters to them, what they stand for, you know, people will start to choose things that they 
that they really enjoy, that they're passionate about, and then they become great at it. And I think that if we do things correctly, this could lead to an, like a full-on renaissance. I believe the fate of humanity in our nation, we're at that pivotal moment. And if we make the right decisions over the course of the next decade, things are gonna turn out really, really well for us. And I think if we make the wrong decisions, things are gonna turn out really, really poorly you know, for us and the rest of the world. What happens in America affects everyone. I still believe America is the light of the world. That light might be dimming, but it's by no means out. The American dream is still alive. I think that, you know, the, 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 the concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I mean, America still has extraordinary potential. And I think we just need the right leadership uh, to ensure that we fulfill our fullest potential. Rock, talk a little bit about universal earned income versus universal basic income or UBI. Yeah, so yeah, this would be largely semantics, but semantics and words matter, right? One, call it as a handout. The other is a hand up or helping you understand that you've earned it by being an American, by participating, being a you know part of the part of the system. You know, you're earning, call it $1,200 a month. And then people might say, well, how do you pay for that? Well, what if we eliminate social security? What if we eliminate unemployment? What if we eliminate all the welfare systems and homeless systems? And instead of like spending just the ones I mentioned, that's $2.67 trillion a year, add up all the other administrative costs and things of that nature. I don't think it'll cost us much more, might even cost us less in the end. I'm still running the numbers on this. But instead of having those programs that have high overhead and are not really serving everyone as well as they could, just give every American $1,200 a month. It probably won't cost us more. And I think individually, we know how to take care of ourselves better than a government program does. And it realigns incentives. Have you ever, you know, have you ever met anyone or thought about this idea that if you're on unemployment and you're looking at a job and you're like, well, if I get that job, how much more money am I going to make? How much harder am I going to have to work? And that some people are, you know, there's an there's a perverse incentive in place that makes people not want to work. If you gave everyone $1,200 a month and if they get a job that's all incremental income, you've eliminated the bad incentives. You've, you've given everyone an incentive to do something while at the same time making sure that no American is starving to death and everyone at least has a roof over their head. We're not guaranteeing a high quality of life. You've still got the incentive to pursue your own happiness and pursue your passions. But if we want to show the world how it's done, you know, if we want to be that example that, you know, call it the light of the world, we really have to be something that when people come here, they're like, yeah, Americans are really good at taking care of their people. You know, we should be emulating them. I don't think that's the impression that international people, when they walk the streets to San Francisco or New York today, they don't leave going, yeah, America's got it all figured out. But I think we can figure a lot of it out. But it starts with making sure that we're taking care of all of the people, aligning the incentives and building the systems. Like, I, I think it's all possible. I think I'm confident we can do this. But I think most importantly, it starts with choice. We need more choices. We need a choice beyond the red and blue that we've only had throughout our entire lives. Got silent. <laughs> Got silent. <laughs> um, all right, so we talked UBI. I was that was one of the questions I was actually going to ask. That was my next question, um, and you know, your idea of how to pay for it is is uh pretty interesting i guess um i can't find i can't find any immediate you know fault or something i would disagree with i'm sure we can pick apart everybody's plan but i don't think this is a good form to do that but i think you got a good grasp of some of this stuff um i'm mostly just intrigued by you as an individual you seem like an, an interesting person just period you know um i like that you're involved in tech uh, like I always say, tech, uh, tech is responsible for evolution of the human. So it's the most important thing that people need to focus on outside of everything else, because where tech goes, we all go. <laughs> I mean, they, they they control the conversation, literally, right? They get to say what's allowed and what's not, right? 
So how do you feel about like the sense some censorship? You know, if you were president, how would you handle the the big tech companies and their censorship of you know many voices? Yeah, I mean, it's this is again one of the problems of managing things in a rear view mirror. You know, it's like okay, oh now we have a couple of tech companies that have more power than any media company has ever had. You know, they have as much power as all the media companies combined into one. And we knew before tech was here that 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 would present a real issue for us. And so part of the problem is you have to have a, a, a real understanding of the, the road ahead. I feel like our, our uh, uh, the world is changing. Tech leads us, but I don't feel our leadership have their hands on the wheel. Like, I don't think they even understand the wheel. Um, and so uh, I, I share this view, which is why I think we need leadership that understands, like literally has their finger on the pulse. They know exactly what's going on kind of in the world as much as any one individual can, but also understands where things are going so that you can, you know, predict the necessary moves before you, you know, you hit the wall or whatever it might be that, you know, the, or the cliff that's, you know, right in front of us. And I think that we are essentially navigating an obstacle race in some sense. And I feel like um, uh, the big tech companies are, uh, uh, able to operate really outside of the system. And the best we can do is be reactive rather than proactive. And so I'm, I'm very concerned. I think that um, uh, the, the way that the tech companies are censoring uh, uh, freedom of speech uh, is, is concerning. And especially when it's impacting our elections, right? If big tech is siding with, call it one political party, that is, uh, I mean, this undermines our entire democracy. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Um, Brittany Kaiser is, uh, is in the house with me right now. Brittany Kaiser uh, worked on six US presidential elections, three Democratic, both Obama elections, three Republican. Uh, and she was one of the heads of Cambridge Analytica. There's a movie that she made called The Great Hack where she became the whistleblower on how they essentially hacked the election with Facebook to put Donald Trump in office. And so we, we kind of understand how this stuff really works. And these are Where's very- Where's she at though? Brittany! <laughs> Brittany! <laughs> hey, Hotep, I got a question for both you and I'll, I'll bring her in right now. <laughs> hey, Hotep. She's got... Peter, Peter, she's in her room to the left. Hotep, I got a question for both you and Brock. Ready, ready to jump on camera? So we've recently ready enough. issued money. Right. Hey, Brock, stick around. So we've recently seen the government- Hey, Kaiser in that. What's up, Brett? Hey, guys. Good to see you. So we've recently seen the government issue money to Americans. And the way they issued it was kind of a clusterfuck. Uh, went to the states. Sometimes the states didn't pay people on time. Sometimes they didn't pay people. Sometimes they paid too much to people. Sometimes they paid dead people. <laughs> I, yeah, it's true. I have a solution, and I want to hear your feedback. Why can't we just make your Social Security number- a blockchain wallet address and utilize the blockchain to pay people in circumstances, whether it be universal earned income, UBI, you know, crisis like this. Uh, Hotep, you go first. That's what's about to happen. That's exactly what they what they're about to do. Um, I don't know why it hasn't happened sooner. I was just talking about this the other day. Instead of having mail-in ballots, why not? give everybody when they vote uh, an address and put the election on the blockchain so everybody can see the results for themselves. That, that's, where, that's where we're gonna, that's where we're going. There's no question about it. I mean, the underlying innovation of what blockchain did, right, is it solved for the double spend. The internet that we, we know of today is the internet of information. The problem with the internet of information is you can copy, paste, and duplicate any information, hence all the copyright problems. What the blockchain did simply describe is it made it so that information can only be in one place. And what that is enabling is things like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency and other things, but eventually it will enable and one of the holy grails of technology is solving digital identity. Once I can be on the internet and I know that I'm the only me and at once you all of a sudden, yes, you can start to have elections using this technology and you know that there will be no voter fraud like and you can eliminate all the friction. And part of the reason why 
we're not all engaged and people are not voting in the mass numbers that they should is because there's, it, there's a lot of friction. There's just election day. It's, it's complicated. If we make it easy, we're going to see a lot more voter engagement. So let's make it easy. I'm not sure everyone wants that. Um, That's a good point. I know I, know I do. I want, I want every American to participate in this and the future elections if possible. I think uh, they don't. Want, I don't think. I don't think the powers that be want to give that many people voices. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, I we have the silent, very. We have no. Excuse me. We have the vocal major, major. I mean, a vocal minority. We have a small number of people deciding the fates of all of us, and I think that it's important that we all are participating in the process of of choosing our fates. So yes, take the stimulus money and. Uh, unemployment and all the things that, you know, uh, have gone out to people during COVID. I mean, this is stuff you could get money into everyone's hands same day. Uh, <laughs> I know. mean, yes, let's, 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 let's implement these solutions. Technology should be here as a tool to enhance our lives. And I'm convinced if we make the right decisions, it will be. And I really, do think, I, I really do think we're going to see voting on the blockchain very soon. It's already been tested in five different states. And that was specifically to test early voting and absentee ballots. Now that most of the country is going to actually be voting using an absentee ballot, then it makes sense. Like that, Those were the five pilot projects specifically for uh, members of the military and veterans. So it, it makes a lot of sense to roll out uh, that across the US now that we're, we're not really sure what it's going to look like in November, how many people will actually go to an in-person voting booth and how many people will have to learn an entire new way of voting that even if they voted before, they probably have never ordered a ballot to their house and understood how to fill that out and how to get it back in on time, which is mm -hmm. going to be our biggest challenge. And, and Brittany, please forgive me for like uh, giving you no notice and just throwing you uh, live on to- <laughs> You know, I'm always ready. I'm always ready. <laughs> in the future, Listen, she I'll can handle I'll it. I'll give you at least a few minutes notice. <laughs> she can handle it. Brittany is a beast. Hey, Brittany, those five <laughs> projects, did they actually use the blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, uh, two it different been, apps that were tested, actually. It and couldn't so, have been more uh, because uh, on the last election in June in New York, they still are waiting for the tabulated results. Oh, and that's but, just- wait, New, New, it, um, New York is going to try to use technology that in, improves democracy? Are you kidding? But, let me just give you two data points of what New York has done this year. And again, I, 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 I really only want to speak positively, so I won't ever say anything negative of an individual. But I will talk about problems with the system and problems with uh, specific legislation. So to be on the ballot as a presidential candidate in the state of New York last year, you needed 15,000 signatures, like petitions. In April, during COVID, they didn't reduce the number to make it easier. They increased the number from 15,000 to 45,000 to ensure that third party candidates couldn't be on the ballot. And it gets even worse. Third, party, um, third parties, like parties themselves, they also put in a new rule that says if, you're, if you put a presidential candidate on the ballot and jump through all these hoops and your candidate doesn't get enough votes in the election that your party is disbanded and shut down, making it so that no third parties want to even be involved in putting candidates on the ballot. Basically, New York has created a monopoly or a duopoly on Democratic and Republican basic, uh, a Democratic Republican future and doing everything they possibly can to ensure that we have that indefinitely. Mm. Now, you're working mm. with uh, Mark Cuban on some of that stuff where you're challenging and, and trying to create better access for third voices. Yeah, I, I think working with Mark Cuban would be an overstatement. I've, uh, I, I, I know Mark Cuban. We're not friends. We, we, we've connected. But he's a supporter of a nonprofit uh, that does uh, 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 assist third party <laughs> candidates in uh, litigating and other things if they are unjustly being prevented. I can tell you as someone running a campaign, I always knew the system was likely a little rigged against third party candidates, but I didn't realize how rigged it is. And I can tell you as someone inside the system, uh, uh, it, it's amazing to see um, how many hurdles and obstacles are put in place to protect the duopoly. But all that does is it gives me more conviction. All it does is make me realize that what I'm doing is really, really right. 
because our future, I think, depends upon us having another choice. And it's not about me. I'm not attached to this outcome. I am happy to serve our country as janitor, as president, or <laughs> anything in between. Uh, I am here and happy to serve our collective future. And uh, uh, I think I'm, you're a little too overqualified for the janitor position. I was literally <laughs> just going to say it. I'm hard. Well, my my point is, I will never ask someone to do a job I wouldn't be willing to do myself. Brittany, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Who who got you that Versace shirt? <laughs> uh, me, myself, and I. Thank you for asking. Okay, you smooth. I like that. I like that. that's a good pick. That's a good it, pick. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Hotep was the only one going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, Britt, I want to. I want to. Oh, um, I want to just dive into your mind really fast, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Um. So they say that company you ran was responsible for getting Trump elected. Is this true or false? I would say that a political campaign is a very complex puzzle. And if you remove any one of the pieces, it's very unlikely that in such a closely tied election that there would, that there would have been a victory if you take out one of the most important pieces. Uh, through running data-driven programs, you have the evidence of how effective you're being. That's the entire point of using data science. Uh, what kind of data did you guys have? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, what, what I'm telling you is that in terms of the way that we measured our effects on people, you could see that in certain precincts, people who otherwise would have not come out to vote or otherwise um, would have uh, been persuaded for one candidate or the other were in droves. You know, sometimes there there's 20 to 30 percent change in the way that they see the world after you run a campaign, talking to certain people. I, it's it's so important to be able to use data to understand people, and if you're doing that for positive purposes, like getting them to register to vote and and actually care about politics again, then that's good. The, the problem with the company that I used to work for is that they helped run negative campaigns, you know, campaigns that could be considered voter suppression to get people to disengage from politics or to, or for instance, you know, the way that uh, that some Russian groups used it, uh, making a Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter uh, rally in the exact same place in order to incite so violence. So these, these groups also had access to the data through Cambridge? No, not through Cambridge, um, because the data of Americans can be bought by anyone in the world. You don't have to be an American company or an American to mm. buy data on us, which is why I spend so much time helping write data protection and privacy laws, because Russia didn't need to coordinate with anyone. They could just purchase the data or access it. Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, I think you could look it up, but I, I think it's known that uh, Facebook was selling the Chinese government uh all of our information at one point I, that's not happening anymore right. but uh that 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 happened so, <laughs> so so what was the big scandal with cambridge analytica right so uh from around 2010 to 2015 facebook had something called the friends api which was a data pipeline uh where over 40,000 companies paid to be a, a part of the facebook developer program and those 40,000 plus companies could not only take the data uh, of, of me if I consented by playing Candy Crush or Farmville or answering a quiz of what's my favorite Disney princess, mm -hmm. every single other person oh, in my network, Disney you know, princesses. <laughs> well, well, once you start to answer those questions, it gives an extra data set besides the rest of your data in Facebook, which the pipeline could take. So the Friends API allowed people who did not consent to their data to be taken. You know, my mom, my grandparents, my friends, all of their data came with it once I consented, which is, you know, that's not legal under any data protection framework anywhere in the world. I can't consent on behalf of another able-bodied adult. So that was the original scandal that they were had all this data. Everybody that was a part of the Facebook developer program had much more data than they should have ever had access to. And it just so happened that one of those companies is an elections company that was involved in Brexit and Trump. So therefore the controversy became exponential uh, besides just the rest of the commercial marketing companies around the world that were using that data to sell a new type of car to Americans. For so instance. Cambridge Analytica really didn't do anything wrong. It's really Facebook who gave everyone access to this. 
Now, from from the beginning, the issue was Facebook building out a platform that allowed data that no one consented to to be taken. So that was the original big issue, of yeah. course. But the way in which Cambridge Analytica worked with certain clients in order to put out what what I would consider, uh, you know, negative communications that affect the legitimacy of our democracy. Yes, I have a problem with that too. But I think I think the, yeah. the, the nuance here is legal or not, you know, then moral ethical and all the other things is a, di is a different debate. But I think, right. I, I think what I heard there is, and, and Facebook may not have broken the law either. And the question is, you know, uh, again, it, back to why we need leadership that understands the current state of the world and where we're going. Um, we have a lot of laws that don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have a bunch of things that are completely legal that are causing us incredible harm. Uh, uh, th this is the problem with uh, doing everything looking backwards and looking back over very long periods of time, and especially why it's so important today as, I mean, the, the speed at which the world is changing. I mean, it used to take a, a decade in modern times to go from a zero to a billion users, to then seven years, to then five years, to then two years. I mean, we have systems now that could radically change the world that don't exist today, 12 months from now. Mm, indeed. So what was your working rate relationship like with the Trump campaign? What, what, what type of things did you, did you guys actually run the ads themselves or you just, just provide data? So uh, this, this was basically modeled as data science as a service. So okay. we had data engineers and data scientists that would be undertaking qualitative and quantitative research, mm -hmm. uh, pulling that political polling data back in in order to figure out everyone in America, how likely they are to be a Trump supporter or a Hillary supporter, um, what, what political issues are most important to them, you know, education, healthcare, national security, you always model for people's top three favorite issues. Mm -hmm. And then likelihood to turn out. So is someone always going to vote every single time, even if there's a hurricane outside? Or do you have to drag people to get them to the polls? And there's kind of no point in talking to them because they're not going to vote anyway. And all of that helps you do high level strategy. Uh, planning everything from yeah. where your rallies are going to be to who you invite to events, what you say to whom and why. And yeah. that, you know, that's really the entire package. So we had people in Trump Tower, uh, as well as in San Antonio working under Brad Parscale. A, a lot of those people are still running Trump 2020, actually. Mm, mm. Yeah. That's pretty neat, pretty neat. So you guys just provide the data and this team looked at it. And did you guys add any strategy as part of a consulting package or it was just pure data? Like, no, it, it, all like, of the like, data like who, who chooses those metrics to track? Uh, so at, what you're trying to do is figure out all of the typical um, political audience groups. So but but is, it the, is it the Trump campaign that's choosing these top metrics or is it Cambridge Analytica choosing these top metrics? It, in general, or, or political campaigns or even commercial marketing, most of the KPIs are the same. Except okay. you're not trying to register people to vote on the commercial side, but that could be considered, you know, a sale conversion, for instance. So you guys already had this project pro or product set up to handle elections. Absolutely. Ah. Uh, yeah, the, the company had already worked on, you know, 50 to 100 elections around the world before it even came to America. Ah, indeed, indeed. She had some stain in the game. <laughs> you can call it that. <laughs> and how long were you with them? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. And prior to the Trump campaign, what were you doing? Um, I was uh, studying to be a human rights lawyer, so I did a lot of work with. The no, United I mean with Cambridge Analytica. Oh, with Cambridge. Yeah. So I worked on I worked on elections in around twenty different countries, helping design programs for political parties or candidates, sometimes governments. I did a lot of commercial work as well, but that's just designing what a backend data science program should look like so that whether it's a commercial company or a politician, they're achieving their goals in a scientific measured way. So how does that stuff connect with what you were just saying you do outside of that? <laughs> so I joined, <laughs> uh, I joined the company in order to learn how to use data science to achieve goals for uh, the human rights campaigns that I was working on. I so gotcha. 
usually when before everything became digital, it was very hard to measure your impact. Political mm -hmm. polling isn't very accurate. And if you don't have enough data, if you're not undertaking seriously uh, advanced predictive modeling, then you can't really tell what effect you're having, um, how impactful you're being, and how to optimize what you're doing. So I, that's what I wanted to learn. That's why I joined uh, to learn how to use these tools for, for the types of work I was already involved in and got uh, quite a few more clients than I ever expected to <laughs> from a, you, a wide range of backgrounds, including ones that I don't agree with. <laughs> so were you like an account manager or were you the actual data scientist? Like I, I was uh, the director of business development. So I would go around the world meeting with people who were prime minister or president or, or wanted to be and, and to figure out what capacity they had, what data they had access to, what they were trying to achieve and design that whole program for them. Oh, uh, you got lots of travel in. Your, your, your passport looks nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> used to be on the plane every day. Oh, and, and I mean, we, we've been traveling the world together for a few years, so. Um, uh, oh, you guys are a team. She's got, she's got wings and definitely is, you know, been ranking in the miles. <laughs> so, so, so you guys are a team? Uh, yeah, uh, Brittany and I have been um, uh, working together, not officially, but for the last few years, uh, Brittany found her path to her road to redemption, <laughs> right? You know, with her whistle blowing and everything else and decided to get out of the presidential political game and actually moved to Wyoming to put in place all the blockchain legislation with Caitlin Long and has like become a, a complete hero in our industry of progressing technology, uh, uh, helping it create value and bring value to a state. And um, I don't know if anyone else could have pulled her out of retirement to get her back into the, <laughs> into the presidential <laughs> political game, but at least for the right reasons this time. Absolutely, mm. yeah. I, I told everyone it would be a while before I got back into politics, but you know, I guess, I guess two and a half years is enough of a break. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you what did you blow the whistle on? What did you what did you write a tat tat? <laughs> <laughs> really on the on the whole data industry. You know, m most people don't realize uh, the kind of kleptocratic nature in which nearly every device that we use is completely built to take away as much of our personal information and therefore our value as possible without returning something of value to us. So, so people it, hadn't I, known this until you came out. I, you know, the last time people were talking about this in, in the public zeitgeist, so to say, was when Edward Snowden came out. And what I, th I feel like most of the global audience took away from that was we should be afraid of what our governments are, are collecting about us. And if our government is spying on us and if we have our privacy under the eyes of, of you know, our, our government's infrastructure. But really, Edward also had quite a lot to say about how much companies were collecting from people. It's just not what stuck. It's not what went into the headlines. That was NSA prison project. This is what the governments have access to. So uh, it's been quite a few years since people started to really think about the, the now almost utility-like platforms that they use every day, like Facebook, and what are the intentions, ethics, and moral guidelines that those companies are willing to or not willing to abide by. So it's been a huge education process. Uh, making the intangible tangible, helping to describe to people what data actually is and what it means and why they should care about their privacy or at least how to protect their data and share it in a safe way if they're happy to engage. You know, that's, uh, it's, it's the long education process. Yeah, Brittany's been uh, a real leader in the own your data movement and creating awareness. You know, the, the world, you know, there was gold and then oil became the new gold. Data is the new oil like, and helping people understand that their data has value, who's collecting that data, what they're doing with your data. You know, I, I think most of us would be very disturbed to know that our phones and our devices are always listening and keeping track of everywhere we go, everything we say. And it's like, if we really knew who all has our information, then what they do with that information, who they sell it to, like there's a whole world that we can't see, but this is the year 2020. You know, this is a year of, you know, I call this the visionary 20s. And I think, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna wake up to the reality of the world in which we live. And we're not gonna like everything we see, which is why we need to stand up and do something about it. So, so Britt, you know, but prior to this, you were, you know, it seems like you were very much involved in human rights, right? So mm -hmm. was it human rights? 
um, protecting people's information from the beginning or did it evolve into protecting people's information? So uh, for ever since the Universal um, Declaration of, of Human Rights at the United Nations was published, we've always had a human right to privacy. So if you are, if you study human rights law, if you work in human rights advocacy, uh, privacy and protecting people's data is always something that is a component of, of the work that you do. So I've been working on that, you know, since, since I was in college, uh, but really realizing the practical steps to protecting your data, which I feel like I really only came to when I got more integrated in the blockchain industry is not just keeping your data to yourself, but how can we talk more about data protection, how we can have transparency and consent in order to monetize or share our own data in a, in a safe way, as opposed to just thinking about how we how we stop people from getting access to our data. Because I, I wouldn't have joined a company like Cambridge Analytica if I don't really truly believe that AI and data science are going to solve a lot of the world's greatest problems. In order to do that, we need people to not be afraid to share their data and have mechanisms or at least technologies that would make them feel comfortable that they could share their data anonymously or pseudonymously in a safe way uh, where we can become inputs into algorithms that are you know, curing diseases uh, before they become global pandemics. You know, that, that's really what, what the goal is, to, to make data protection accessible, understandable, and implementable. Hey, Brock, yesterday, was it, I think it was yesterday or the day before, we had four CEOs of social platforms and Amazon, well, three and Amazon appear in Congress. Did you get a chance to watch that? Uh, cliff notes. I, I wish I was uh, had the time to just sit and and watch these things in their totality. Uh, unfortunately, we are. Uh, I mean, it's it's seven days a week. Uh, you know, eighteen to twenty hours a day. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a really really big week. Um, and I don't know if you saw the the stock prices. You know, following that, but. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, the equities are up. <laughs> so what did you glean from some of the comments from Jeff Bezos and uh, Tim Cook when they talked about interference, election interference and corporate interference from China? I mean, I'd say that uh, we, don't, we don't know the, the right questions to ask. Uh, you know, you can pull these people uh, in, but unless you have, you know, people in government that understand what's happening, you're, you're, you're never, it's not going to do anything. You, you, you literally have a group of people asking you, that don't understand what's going on, asking questions. I mean, <laughs> and yeah, you need, you need Brittany to ask them questions. <laughs> yeah. You need, you need, you need people like the four of us, right? We're all qualified to ask probably better questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and that's sad, right? This is, this is where, and it's not to take away from legislators, right? Legislators have an important role to play, but it's like, we're, we need diversity of skills. You know, where are the engineers? Where are the computer scientists? Where are the data analysts? Like, it, it's called, we need a government that is like sufficiently skilled with all the diversity, like that would allow us to function really well. You know, we, we, we need like the full toolbox. We don't need a thousand hammers. <laughs> Speaking of hammers, hotel. we need some wrenches, you know, <laughs> we, we, we need some screwdrivers. We need, <laughs> you know, we we need we need diversity in our government like uh, that. I like that. I like that. I'm stealing that. By the way, that's stolen, bro. That's, yeah, I'm sorry. Way, on the same building analogy, right? We also it seems like every time we look at an issue, it's like it's like remodeling a house or knocking the house down and rebuilding. It's like our government just remodels and remodels and remodels. Though we need to like actually take a look at you know what if we had a blank slate, right? What if we had a, you know, a blank canvas? Well, you know, what, this is what we do when we're like buying a house. You're like, oh, what are the parts we keep? And we would look at legislation and law and say, is it still doing what it was intended to do? There's this concept of the law of unintended consequences. It's like we create things and then we just forget about it. We're not actually checking to see if it's like actually still relevant, doing what it's supposed to be doing. There's a whole lot of like just really basic common sense things that, doesn't seem to happen in the context of government. Um, mm. And so yeah. I hope to bring some common sense, you know, that also makes dollars and sense like to the equation. 
Hey, Brock, have Simple you the stuff we can all understand? Hey, Brock, have either one of the campaigns reached out to you, either Trump or Biden? Um, uh, uh, yes, um, we, <laughs> we, we know people um, uh, um, on both sides. Uh, at, uh, uh, and I, I'd say, um, I don't know, maybe Brittany, you want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm 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 truly like you won't even hear me really mention the names of the other candidates other than Kanye like that's the one person I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll, I'll reference by name and as I said you know happy to uh, I'm here to support him mm -hmm. like I, I I believe we need independent candidates like we need more choice this isn't about me it's about us collectively. And if you're on that team of what I'd say is real progress, right? Real progressives, right? Yes, please. And so I don't want to ever say anything, you know, because I don't need to like throw mud, right? I don't need to talk negatively. I have real vision. I have real solutions, you know, but it, it's just like one of those things. It's like, talk about how we inspire the next generation, right? When you watch your politicians basically go on stage during the primary, slinging mud at each other, and then as soon as the primaries are done praising whoever the candidate is, it's like, where's the authenticity here? Yeah. Like, it's like completely hypocritical. Yeah. Like, you know, I believe in integrity, like values, principles, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, you know, if we want to like show real leadership, what is real leadership? Real leadership is stewardship. And it's not, I don't need to like, talk, talk, you know, I don't need to like sit here and criticize you, like to, to demonstrate my value and my worth and my ability to contribute. You know, let's actually get to the heart of the issue, which is like, talk about what you're going to do. Talk about what you know, talk about what skills you have. Why are you relevant? Why are you well suited for that job? It really, really bugs me how, uh, you know, our political system seems to run on negative campaigns and all the early political advisors I met with told me that I have to run negative campaigns. They said the only way to play in the political game is to, uh, your objective, ha objective has to be to eviscerate your opponent or your enemy. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, I refuse to play that game. <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna rise above this sort of partisan political game that you tell me all about, because I, I think that that's the problem. You know, let's actually like sit around a table because what happens to you is going to happen to me. We are truly in this together. And I think that it's that mindset that is is the problem at its core. And we are capable of rising above that. Yeah, I've seen I've seen people run for office. And then when they start running off, they start attacking, you know, and I'm like wondering why, like, right, because that's not what I would do. Right. And like, I'm not even thinking about that. Well, watch what I'm about to do. Right. That's what I'm thinking about it. And I see people attacking. I'm wondering why. And in my head, I said, I bet you there's like some unwritten rule that you have to attack your opponent. And that's what's probably going around in the place. Yeah, and I, I can verify it. And you just I, verified that. I was told by everyone I have to do that. And I just, I have, I, I'm so principled. I said, no, I refuse. But they're like, you have to. It's the only way. This is how it works. I'm like, no. And yeah. they're like, but, but. It, it happens too often to not be a real unwritten rule. Right. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 literally, I was told by everybody, but I'm like, no, I believe like, I believe in integrity. And I don't mean like a lowercase I integrity. I mean, capital I. And, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I hope we're like, we're actually breaking some, some of the status quo, right? That what has served us in the past is not going to serve us in the future. Like we have to find another way. We have to rise above this past. We have to find a way to heal as a nation and talk about the things that people don't want to talk about. Like, let's talk about the, the Native Americans and the indigenous and the fact that our government made 500 treaties and has never once abided by any of them. Mm. Like, like, let's have these conversations. Mm. You know, we talk about Black Lives Matter right now. You know, people in Africa being taken over here without con their consent and, you know, made to work as slaves. Like, uh -oh. let's have these... Let's have these uncomfortable conversations because until we like actually do the work and like get into this stuff and stop sweeping it under the rug and pretending like it, you know, it's like if we want to find a path forward as a nation, it does require, you know, like healing our past, doing the hard work, looking inward and figuring out how to like, you know, work together. 
And then from there, as we start to align and start to like, you know, fix all of the stuff that's in the pro in the past, then we can really say, how are we going to do this together going forward? How can we build a better world that we all want to live in, that it is for and includes all of us? Hey, Hota, mm -hmm. you think we're going to have debates? And if so, you think Brock should be at it? I think he should. I think he should be at it. You know, I think we need more debates, right? Like, you know, for example, the whole COVID thing and how they're silencing those doctors. I'm like, well, why don't we just have like a public debate? You bring your doctors, I bring my doctors, and then let the people decide, right? <laughs> and well, then, you, you know. know but, but, you know what's crazy is hydrochloroquine is over the counter in so many European countries. Right. It's actually benefiting those countries and lowering their numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I, you know, I love debate. I think debate without debate, how do you find truth, right? Debate is where truth is found, you know? And I think that's why so many people deny debate because they understand that they're insecure in their position. And if that were to get exposed, they'd lose all validity. <laughs> <laughs> so for the record, I am down to debate. <laughs> <laughs> A any of our core candidates, I, I, th I think maybe, you know, you know, we should have some more fun with it. I mean, this would be like one of those Kanye and I should like be having those conversations. I think um, our Republican candidate was, is like down to debate. Um, yeah, uh, he seems to he seems to be down our our Democratic candidate. Uh, uh, um, Joe Biden. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I would I'm down to debate, you know, any one of them in the traditional forums. You know, any forums down to do it here on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, for the record. I'm still, I'm still in that too, Brock. I need your number because you got a lot of gems. I'm still in that too. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna even call these people by name anymore. You're the Republican <laughs> candidate, and you're the Democratic candidate. That I love that. I love that. That is so I can't great. Can't wait for him to be able to debate them. I <laughs> but I, but. I mean, in the right forum, obviously, I believe in treating people with dignity and respect, you know. So if I'm on that stage, I will, you know, say hello and greet you correctly because right. I believe I, I believe in, that we need to like old school, more dignity, more respect, yeah. civil discourse, you know. Yeah. I, I, but definitely down to debate. I, I completely agree. And the problem with, uh, you know, like some people are like, oh, Brock, give them hell, give them hell. I'm like, I don't have to give anyone hell. I just have to give them truth and mm. they'll feel like they're in hell. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Deep. That's exactly it, man. That's exactly it. Oh, uh, is it, is it, is it, I don't know what the rules are for getting into the debate, but what are the rules? Like, no, you have it, to have it's a another rig system. You need, they, 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 they take five pollsters, you know, and, and then you, you need to have 15% of the popular vote. And they're only going, you know, it's not truly 15% of the population that's being polled. It's, you know, right. It's, 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 it's a sample. probably a semi-corrupted data set. And because they don't want there to be more than two candidates, um, right. you know, on that stage. But uh, uh, we may not have debates, as, as I think you were asked. And so Donald Trump, excuse me, um, our Republican candidate, <laughs> um, if, if our Democratic candidate, if, if the debates are not happening, I could see our Republican uh, uh, incumbent, like potentially debating someone that would normally not be eligible just to be able to get the airtime. Like uh. I, this year is like the year where we should be expecting the unexpected. Basically mm. it's like all the old like rules, everything seems to be like falling apart and like whatever, whatever is unlikely is becoming likely. It's like, uh, it's like we flipped the script or something. Mm. And mm. so uh, like this crazy idea, our strategy, if we're not trying to win the election, we're trying to win one, two or three states so that no one wins the election. You know, it's like- Do you uh, know what way, states uh, yet? Um, yeah, we-, we uh, Oh, um, you will know. We, oh, we, we, we will know we're, we're in the data analysis right, right. now. I'm okay. uh, taking a look at where to apply ourselves uh, most. I'm from Minnesota, you know, so I'm a kid from Minnesota. Um, I was uh, uh, adopted by the Lakota uh, people of Standing Rock. And Finally, so, Rhode uh, Island is in play. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 
you know, but now, but this strategy is like, when people hear it, they're like, this isn't impossible. Like this idea of winning one state, like if we applied ourselves with the right people, call it just the four of us here, plus another 400 like us, you know, this, this is like within the, this is within reach. This it's is actually within, easier. It's, this is it's within easier. the realms of possibility. It's, it's easier to try to do that, win one state, right? Than it is to try to win all the states, right? And, and exactly. I, th I think, I think you can, I think it can be done. I think that can be done. Like, like there's a lot of people that say I'm running for president. And I'm like, man, shut up. You ain't about to win nothing. But you know, like, I, I think it, when you think of it like that, because here's, all right, so here, here, let me ask you this question. How are you going to do that? How are you going to raise enough awareness to make that happen? Well, it's, it's going to require um, people that understand technology and the internet and social media, because the traditional tools. Are those people in those states that you're targeting though? Yes. And so, okay. uh, it, it, well, yeah, it, it's on a bi-state basis, clearly. And so you have a very, very targeted marketing uh, uh, strategy to create awareness. You know, one, one of the problems obviously is we have to like get as much traditional media, news media, you know, whether that be the news stations, radio. Who's gonna shoot your content? Um, we're basically, this is an invitation to participate. You know, anybody that's watching this that like, you know, you wanna like get involved and help uh, by all means, we've got a bunch of content people, we're shooting stuff. Um, we'll send over some stuff that you can check out after this. We've I got think, a, I think that's where you, I think, you know, I'm playing, I'm playing advisor here. I'm a marketing advisor. That's what I do for a living. So I'm playing advisor at this point. And I think that you should throw a huge bag at a really brilliant content creator. Like, I think like that should be like your decision is like your next major decision, like within the next week, who is going to be that person to kind of take your vision and 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 bring it to the screen. And, and, that's and how this is going to get done. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, traditional campaigns and rallies are out. This is all about can you create that content and get it distributed and seen by enough people. Well, no I mean, you can pay media, media may may not want to tell your story. You have to. I, I wouldn't pay. even. I wouldn't even go traditional. I would go straight Google ads and YouTube ads and Facebook ads, man, and just create content that goes viral and yes. then, and just target those zip codes, right? The zip codes that matter. Exactly. You just be the man in Minnesota, right? Like, like my mm -hmm. friend's running a campaign right now uh, in just one city and like literally people recognize him when he walks down the street, right? And, and that's really what you need. You need that recognition and that name recognition and that face, face recognition. So, right. you know, I, I think somebody who's going to be able to make that memorable first five seconds, like the first five seconds of everything when a piece of content comes across your screen. I mean, that's what you need preload for the YouTube ads, right? So it's somebody who knows how to just zap somebody's attention in like two and a half seconds. They're like, wait, what am I about to watch? Right? <laughs> Like, like I, that's the type of content creator um, I will be looking for. And, and non-traditional too, right? Like not somebody who I do political campaign ads and you're like, vote for right. me. Not that's like- exactly like, the traditional political campaign. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, like somebody. Um, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with you um, and, and talk to you about some of the people that we're looking at, share with you some of the, the, the stuff that we're thinking about if, if, if you're interested. Yeah, I'm. At, I am. I am only because I like you though. Because you, you, I'm. I'm very hard to impress. Like nobody impresses me. And if you've impressed me twice in this conversation, I'm like, hmm, who is this guy? <laughs> and it ain't got nothing to do with the movies. It's got nothing to do with that. But just you know, this a person that says, you know, I'm not even gonna refer to them by name. Just the Democratic candidate. Just oh, I just love shit like that. It's just like, yes, like this is thinking, right? This is this, this man's brain works. So yeah, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me on. I didn't, I didn't quite know what I was uh, signing up for today, but. Uh... And thank you for having me on, which was a surprise, but always a welcome surprise. <laughs> yeah, definitely a pleasure. You have some fun, Hotep? I did. I did. Uh, I'll, just like them, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, right? <laughs> he just kind of threw me in the lion's den. I'll be honest, I do that shit every now and then. <laughs> and it and it and it worked you know i'm, I'm quite you surprised find yourself at all times 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but now nah, great, great talk. Thank you for uh, making this happen, Chris. Um, got some things to think about. You just, sometimes I do interviews, right? I do a lot of interviews, you know, at least once, twice a week. And I'm just like, oh boy, what's going to happen this time? And what boring <laughs> shit am I up for today? You know, and it's just like, and you know, when you're in for a boring interview, it's like, all right, I'm going to have to carry this thing now. So now you have to like, really, but you know, I think you put together some great minds today that it just made me feel like I was just having a conversation. And I, I just love that. That's what it's all about. Dialogue. Yeah. Brock, do you have fun? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's always good when you're with good people that are like thinking, right. You know, it's, it's, I, I know when I'm with a group of people where we're kind of in the same frequency, you know, I like this term, the free, can see or the freaks mm -hmm. can see frequency frequency right I like um, that. and uh uh and so it's good it, it's it's always good you know when we can sit and have these conversations because we do have the the potential we really do have the power to change the world in which we live mm -hmm. Brittany, mm -hmm. you have some fun Absolutely. I, I, I love being um, surprised anyway, but also so glad to see your faces and be talking about what, what, what I see as some of the most important issues that we're dealing with right now. Listen, uh, she's Brittany Kaiser. He's Brock Pierce. He's Hotep Jesus. I am so glad you guys took some time today to talk. The discussion was good. It was deep. Yeah, I'm going to let you guys go. For having us. Brock? See you in the yeah. <laughs> at least, at least, let's at least get you on the debate stage. Let's just make that happen. And remember, we are doing everything we can with a viable strategy in 2020. We, on November 4th, whatever the outcome, we are going to be focused full time until 2022 in finding other candidates up and down the ticket at a local state and national level that want to run as independents, that see what we see, feel what we feel, and recognize that this is our moment. This is our birthright. We are going to inherit the leadership of this country and the future depends on it. Let's make sure that we leave behind a world for the next generation where they don't just survive, but they thrive. And so I look forward to connecting with everyone I can after election day, supporting everyone that wants to be a part of this change. This is not just about me and this office, it's about all the offices. And then we'll be back again in 2024. Time is on our side. You know, it's good that you're talking about a third party because I think a really solid third party could really have the strongest voice in the future of America. I believe it. I see it. All right, he's Brock Pierce. He's taking the risk of a lifetime, but it's not new for him. He's used to taking risks. Thanks a ton, guys. Hotep, you were great. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Have a good one, guys.